Hello and welcome to the Min Max Show, a good place to forget bad things. I'm Ben <laughs> Hansen, joined by Jeff Markiafala. Hey. In studio here, right. opposite end of the table, we're yeah. respecting social distancing. We're doing social the social distancing. distancing. We had measured earlier that you you had laid down on this table before, That's and true. you're about six feet tall, so uh-huh. we uh-huh. we think we got the distance right here. I think it's perfectly nailed. But uh, yeah, you was... guys will shake hands off screen, off mic. It won't won't be. Um, we we did kiss before we started the video. The but. ceremonial Min Max kiss right before yeah, we start recording. Right. But uh, the voices you're hearing are scattered across Minnesota and beyond. We have Serial Vasquez calling in from Hello. Home. Welcome. No virus is going to keep the Min Max show from going on. Damn it. That's right. Uh, and then we have Kyle Hilliard calling in from his wonderful uh, podcast studio there. Yes. Look, I, I made sure to have a bubbly just to be consistent. You know? Oh, that's very sweet. Very and then we're joined for the first time ever technically on the Min Max show podcast Imran Khan! Yay. Welcome to my world. Welcome. Yeah, everybody <laughs> is now in your world, Imran. Uh, Imran, if you're a new listener or viewer, uh, we worked with at Game Informer for years, and now Imran is a co-host over at Kind of Funny, yes? That is correct, yes. In San Francisco. In San Francisco, such as it is. Ground yeah, how is uh, how's everything going over there, man? Are are we using this as a time to not talk about bad things, or I think we can get into a little bit, and we'll we'll take a positive spin on things later. But just in general, yeah, how's your life in San Francisco throughout the last couple of days? Uh, so they put a shelter in place warning, which is the last step before a lockdown. So basically, things here are kind of scary right now. Things are you, if you leave the house for any reason, you have to have it for a like important reason or exercise. But you have to like stay six feet away from people. You have to. Uh, Make sure it's for like groceries or going to a doctor, or you could actually be arrested. Or and all you see out there now are just cop cars. Like there's no people anymore outside, which is a genuinely creepy feeling I only ever got from video games. I don't re- think I realized that until it happened in real life. So um, you can go out to exercise, though. You can. You have to stay six feet away from other people. Okay. Well, that still seems doable then, right? Just if you want to go out, go for a jog, but just dodge people along the way. For right now, yeah, if it gets worse, then you can't even do that. But for right now, it is, you can still leave the house. Yeah. Just can't socialize in any way. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say this is the wildest thing I've ever seen from society. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and it's, you know, there's a lot of questions about what it means for everything. Seems like the entire world is being remixed in a very strange way. Obviously, our hearts are out for all the healthcare industry workers, uh, everybody who's still going to work whose companies can't shut down which we'll probably talk to a little bit later but i'm sure a lot of people are wondering what it means for min max and i guess like the content we're producing overall uh we're not going anywhere we're Mm -hmm. here for you um it probably means a lot more calling folks in yeah um jeff i'm here this week we'll see how it goes in the future yeah um how you doing with all this jeff uh okay it is it is a very surreal thing to see basically the entire country and world kind of just shut down and say okay everyone just stay home for now if you can yeah and and the wild thing too is we were streaming dirge of cerberus for the celebration of final Fantasy 7 last night and maybe this is just standard but it just popped out more but you know so many people were talking about where they were from like oh i'm watching you from damascus i'm watching you from saudi arabia i'm watching you from brazil from norway from sweden and it's just it would really uh, hit me right in the gut just like it's so bizarre that everyone's on the same page everyone's like yeah we're quarantined, we're kind of mm-hmm. stuck inside, so I guess I'll watch you play Dirge of Cerberus on PlayStation yeah. 2, but it's just so <laughs> wild to have the entire world with the exact same fears, all unified, and in a way that I feel like the world hasn't been maybe since like a World War II even. But you think about mm-hmm. that, and you think about just, it's so nice to have the world unified in a way, in a positive direction. We're not unified for killing anybody, we're unified to try and stop the spread to help the yeah. hospitals, you know? Yeah. It's a really unique feeling overall. Unless you're Vanessa Hudgens, then maybe not. Well, I didn't follow that. I'm not like <laughs> looking into those uh, negative stories there, Imran. Um, but uh, other effects this has on MinMax, just out of the gate before we dive into the rest of the episode, is you probably figured this, but uh, the spring community meetup is not going to be happening for MinMax. Mm. Uh, we've been looking forward to that. Also in conjunction with we were going to have a charity drive for the spring. I had it all lined up. Uh, I shot a a video about it. It was going to publish last Friday. And then it's like, this seems like a tough time to try and rally people for kind of an artistic charity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the charity right now, I guess this the official Min Max spring charity drive is just going to be 
hey, help out hospitals and health industry yeah. workers by just staying stay inside. home. Yes. Yeah. And stay yes. away from other people. Yeah. Yeah. Within reason. Just don't panic. Mm -hmm. Don't get sucked <laughs> into social media. Just follow the CDC's guidelines, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's so wild watching like um, the GDC presentations. Imran, have you checked out any of those? Not really. I saw Mark Cerny's today, but beyond that, I haven't seen anything regard like what they would have usually shown this week at GDC. Yeah, it's really wild because they have on GDC's official Twitch channel, they have just people, presenters like presenting from their home. So I watched uh, one about the sound design of Anthem yesterday, but it's just like everyone is so flat because everyone's just in that awkward phase of like, I guess I'll give this exact speech as if there's a huge crowd here, but I'm mm -hmm. not really here. It's just the strangest thing. Yeah. I think, what more, if you see I think more people crowd. should uh, put themselves in front of a green screen and have a fake audience sort of mm. in the front. Well, you know, that's obviously a fake audience. That's what we're going to unpack here. Yeah. So this week saw the reveal of PlayStation 5 details. We're going to dive into all that stuff, compare it against some new Xbox Series X details. Console wars are here as the world is struggling, but hey, console wars are living on. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, ways to get better during this period. I think the next couple months, realistically, are going to be trying times for everybody. So we're here to help uh, in a way that hopefully we can. Then we'll talk about some other stuff. And then uh, I have a little pop quiz game slash kind of Ooh. discussion piece for you all later about games that were released on the same day throughout mm -hmm. gaming history. So uh, since we're all at home and we have our computers in front of us, should I go check that Twitter thread that you asked to create a couple days ago? Hang on, I'm going to delete that tweet real quick so you can't <laughs> do that. Uh, I know we have a lot of great uh, questions from the community with the MinBox, uh, but hey, Jeff, I'm, since you came all the way from your home in Minneapolis to be in the MinMax studio, I wanted mm -hmm. to start things off by giving you a gift. Let's I hope see. you sanitized Ooh. it. It's extremely oh, yeah, sanitized. Is it toilet paper, okay. please? <laughs> well, it can be. <laughs> Hey, Jeff. Oh, look at this. here we go. MinMax merch. That's right. We got all right. the new different shirts and stuff in. It's computer living And I picked this shirt. one because this is amazing. It's got his face on it specifically. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the only reason. Uh, uh, also, there's this one, uh, which I'm very excited about, which is the Jeff mug. I also got you. <laughs> Perfect. It's very cute. Yeah, I'm I said. Get a close up. Yeah, I said that. Uh, we're going to take a picture of me with this mug so that it's the Hall of Mirrors. We're just going to keep on going. <laughs> yeah, you can check that out. Every at year, every year, like Stephen Colbert did on his show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right, yeah. right. So you can check it out at minmax.com slash merch if you want to see uh, some of that stuff in person. Uh, thanks for everybody um, sticking with us. I know life is stressful, and hopefully our role here is to provide some entertainment throughout this and to keep the content coming, maybe in a slightly funkier way, right? But like all the comments about Min Tracks, our new music podcast, the Matt Helgeson uh hosts have been really sweet like that's such an upbeat fun show so mm -hmm. we're gonna keep rolling ahead probably do more remote episodes of that and everything but okay let's get to it let's please talk about video games please the playstation 5 <laughs> uh the world was a buzz because there's a lot of talk that hey mark cern is gonna get out there and talk about the playstation 5 people have been clamoring for playstation to reveal new details mm -hmm. on the playstation 5 please tell us anything we'll take anything we'll be happy with anything and then it was Mark Cerny going up there and giving a very GDC-style presentation, which was 52 minutes of, I mean, they called it a deep dive. I think that's underselling what that yeah. was. It was That was the deepest dive. It truly <laughs> was. That was Mark Cerny's brain just poured out onto a PowerPoint presentation. And I'm not bashing him for it. Like, the comments were a little bit cruel. People were expecting gameplay for Horizon Zero Dawn 2, stuff like that. Like, yeah. It was dry, but with a genius like Mark starting the industry, we got to know what we signed up for here. This was supposed to be their GDC mm -hmm. presentation. So, yeah. I mean, my, my question is, like, based on those comments that people had, like, would this uh, presentation have gotten as much sort of, like, internet bandwidth, so to speak, if it had just been, like, a GDC thing? Like, it just we would have just seen, like, news stories written about it, right? But now, because it was, like, a, a live stream thing, everyone was like, oh, this is a big PlayStation 5 reveal. But it, it really wasn't that. It was never meant to be. Well, mm -hmm. I, I expected something. I didn't expect it just to be kind of like a longer, drier version of the Wired article. But there are some new specs. But Imran, what did you think of this presentation? I kind of disagree a little bit that it wasn't meant for consumers because there was definitely things that were there to talk to consumers. Like, developers don't care that you can buy extra hard drive space. Like, they just mm -hmm. want to make sure their game can fit. They yeah. like that was a line definitely meant for consumers of like here how here's how you will be able to get more hard drives onto the PS5. 
Yeah, yeah trying that, to... that and hardware compatibility thing about PS4, PS5, that's definitely a consumer facing uh, discussion point and not yeah. something that developers would care about. Yeah, they definitely to... were trying to have their cake and eat it too. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Except it was the weird thing, like I was watching chat and so many people were like, yeah, developers understand how a solid state drive works. Uh, I don't know why you'd be explaining this mm -hmm. if this is actually tailored for developers. But yeah, it's it seems like a hardware genius was trying to explain things to consumers, and yes. he he dumbed it down in his mind. He dumbed it down to layman's terms, but we're that's still several tiers above what game most gamers are going to understand. Yeah, yeah. Kyle. I, I think. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, Kyle, what stood out to you? Um. I guess, well, I mean, the thing that stood out to me was just the the way the presentation was, like, handled. <laughs> like, yeah. Just the way the thing looked with, like, the fake MST3000, like, audience in front and stuff. It was, like, so strange. Am I insane but for thinking that those were real people? Those are not real You're people. You're an insane person. Yeah, I, I, I checked in on the stream. I thought you were doing a bit. Like, I thought you were, like, making a joke about how they were real. Because they were definitely cardboard cutouts. <laughs> I mean, but they were the moving. Insane, I I think they were real people, but I think they were not actually there. I think they're like stock footage that Sony has. No, okay, they, you know, yes, over, yeah, like that. That, were, yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at. No, like they didn't I, have people sitting there shadowed in front of the camera. Yeah. that's no, what I. Thought. I can't imagine that room extended beyond like a green screen and Mark Cerny's podium there. Like I, I, I have to imagine that they just did that all. And through. I do not believe that they were real people either. I think they were animated <laughs> yeah. people. That's insanity. Because, no, it, that when is you truly at, insanity. When you looked at some of the movements that they were doing, the animation was weird and it was off. Well, one kind of looked like Spider-Man and he did thwip out at yes. a certain point. <laughs> that guy was he real. He started swinging across the room, which I found very distracting. <laughs> But at yeah. least it was something to look at uh, other than polite Mark Cerny. I like that. I like that we all have different tiers of conspiracy. It, <laughs> it's like Hanson is like everything's real, and then <laughs> Imran is like, no, the people weren't real, but they were recorded. And Fava's over, like, no, it's all CGI, one hundred percent unreal. I don't CG. think even Mark Cerny is a real person anymore. <laughs> and, There's and a debate. It is. It is weird though that they did it in order to make it feel more realistic or whatever. To try and make the format work, but I think yeah. I think that's the kind of thing that it works against it because we're not the only ones talking about these dumb fake people and whether they're real or not. I think it takes away, and I wish they would have just done it more like a Nintendo Direct style, right. you know, person talking straight to and the camera. They have camera. the state of play format right there, but I understand it's a different cup of tea. Yeah. But okay, for actual takeaways, instead of just talking about the presentation yeah. here, for, um, in terms of actual content, it it kind of felt to me like a large portion of it was just like about how great ssd storage space is like i didn't mm. feel like i was getting excited about playstation 5 it felt like oh ssds are really good and we should all <laughs> adopt them you know right yeah. which is you know if you're a pc gamer it's one of those like okay this is weird to be the talking point but i think it seems to be since the presentation people have been glomming on more and more to these aren't the average ssds that sony's working with here like we yes. have a john There's a little proprietary stuff there right well, yeah, and specifically, okay, there's a lot to unpack here, but John Linneman from Digital Foundry, um, he's obviously very smart when it comes to breaking down tech stuff. Mm -hmm. I think they're the best in the biz, mm -hmm. but John uh, tweeted out saying, the craziest thing about PlayStation 5 is the speed of the SSD. 5.5 gigabytes per second is just part of the story. There's a lot of custom silicon in there to ensure the system isn't bottlenecked in other areas. It's really fast on paper, a lot faster than Xbox Series X even. Beyond that, I was surprised that it follows for off-the-shelf uh, drives, but only if they are certified. There are no drives available today that are fast enough for PlayStation 5, so do not buy one in, prepara do not buy one in preparation, just a solid-state drive. Uh, and then he has more of a breakdown, uh, comparing stuff, talking about Series X is faster in terms of GPU slash CPU. I'm genuinely excited by the fact More teraflops. That there we go. I'm genuinely excited by the fact that the PlayStation 5 and Series X are rather different machines with their own unique strengths. The two machines appear to be to differ more than the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. So it should be an interesting generation. See, I, I came away with the, like a kind of a different takeaway where I wonder how the fact that they are kind of different, uh, more so than like PS4 and Xbox One, is that going to lead to weird ports where it's less consistent about, well, you have to get this game on Xbox One because this, like, this version of the game was optimized better, or like mm -hmm. this game was optimized better for Xbox One versus like, yeah. uh, you know, one being for PS4. That's sort of my takeaways. I, I feel like I, that the architecture differences are maybe like it's good that they're powerful in different ways but you know like art developers going to be you know struggling to figure out okay well how do we make use of these texts and have like a version of the game that is you know at least consistent across both versions 
Yeah, that's a good point. I wonder if it'll bring back Game Informer's The Edge, just talking about you know which, <laughs> yeah. which console is the way it, to go. But then yeah. you think about that combined with there's already going to be so many asterisks for some of these games, at least for like, okay, the PS5 version versus the Xbox Series X version versus the Xbox Series One X version, you know, it's like it's already mm-hmm. gonna be a lot of fine print for buying games in the next generation. Yeah. So it's gonna that be that and like between the the SSD stuff uh, on the PS4 and Microsoft basically confirming that they're gonna have like these proprietary what amounts to memory cards for the the Series X, uh, feels like this weird throwback to a, a proprietary storage, which I don't think people will be super excited about. Yeah, I actually find all that really exciting myself of like, oh, this shit is so weird and new that we're getting back to these situations where they don't know what they're doing anymore. <laughs> so they're just like throwing this to the wall like, okay, how do we solve this problem? And the fact that they're getting there is exciting to me because I, I have been anticipating this next generation as a very evolutionary step. And honestly, I've been anticipating every next generation as a very evolutionary step. So it's cool that they're like poking around the edges with new technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the idea takeaways: if you want to expand your hard drive space, solid state hard drive space for the Xbox Series X, you'll need a proprietary, funky, sweet uh, SSD chip-looking mm-hmm. thing. Uh, and then for Sony, you can use not proprietary stuff, but you should definitely wait if you want to get the yeah, best yeah. possible version of that. Yeah, and that yeah. It, that is what Imran was saying uh, is exciting because it feels like for the last couple of generations, it's always. Well, you can buy one of these consoles, but PC is still always going to be po- more powerful. And it's interesting to hear this, that at this point in time, there isn't a, a hard drive fast enough to even be compatible with the PS5 at this point. So yeah. th- this may be more of, a, more of a situation where consoles have an advantage, however long or short-lived that's going to be with PC games. But the, the fact that they are so, so prioritizing, you know, they're they're making their own custom hardware which is true of every generation but that that they are really thinking about how to eliminate the bottlenecks that have been there in previous con uh console generations is interesting even if it was very hard to parse a lot of that information in yeah the it's, al- it's also yeah. worth noting that like how they handle the actual moving of things over from external storage to like the ssd is going to determine how much of a big deal it is that you can't like immediately buy something that will make your ssd larger Mm -hmm. like if it's as simple as okay i want to play this game it's backed up on the usb it'll take two or three minutes to get it back onto the hard drive like that's fine if it's longer than that if it's like 20 to 30 minutes that's big more of an issue and that becomes an issue of like okay maybe i do need to spend more money for an expansion yeah i think one of the few points where you know cerny was able to get across something that i think consumers would be like genuinely excited about is uh, they won't have to do that thing where you have to reinstall the game basically when there's a big enough patch. Yeah. Uh, Cause he was talking about how like, well, before at some point, if you patch enough things, the, the, the build starts to get really stuttery. So you effectively have to uh, redownload the game as part of the update process because you know, the way patching works, but he was able, I think that was one of the things that got across most clearly was like, because we have SSDs, you won't really need to do that anymore, is that you will have basically whatever the update is, is the new files, and that's basically it, you know, more or less. Yeah. And I know a lot of people were looking forward to some games being revealed at this, even just a tease, but Mark Cerny did drop some game names throughout the stream. Uh, He talked about Jack 2 and Mm -hmm. Dead Space and... Enter the Matrix, yeah, it seemed like. My favorite games, Jack yeah. and 2 and Dead Space. I was like, oh, this is for me. <laughs> it's so awesome. But like, maybe it's just a subtle way of like Mark Cerny just like reminding people about his history in the industry, not going back to Marvel Madness and stuff, but being like, hey, by the way, when I was working on Jack 2, this is how we handled streaming data yeah, off the disc. I mean, those are the examples that he knows best. And, yeah, exactly. And, you know, personally had his fingerprints on. So it's kind of fun also, to see that. He yeah. called Dead Space old school. He was like, I know. Old school. I know. Right. Right. That's 12 years old. I, mean, yes. I guess. I just still think of Dead Space as a pretty modern franchise, but maybe that's a mistake on my part. I don't know. I think it's it was a good idea to drop game names as examples. If you can't show footage like Microsoft did with the suspend resume thing, yeah. of like showing like actual video of like multiple games being suspended and resumed, like that was cool. But if you can say like, hey, you've played Dead Space, you know what I'm talking about with this example. He should yeah. have done more with that, honestly. Yeah, and especially that. By the way, that Xbox video? The cave? 
Like, <laughs> okay, hang on. So yes, <laughs> there's a lot of Xbox stuff to get in later. I would definitely remind me to bring that up, Kyle. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. But I, I was going to say the Dead Space example is perfect because he was talking about 3D audio, and if you're going to talk about audio in games, that is one of the best examples of that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's true. It's either that or you go into a proprietary soundproof chamber where people are wearing <laughs> weird devices. Those yes. are the two things you can talk about when Sitting you're in working with 3D circle, audio. Yeah, you film miserable. your own ear with your phone yeah. and then you text it this to Mark is, Cerny. Look, and then this, you're, is, yeah. this is people exactly... People have been doing this on like DMs for years now and it's <laughs> nice to see Cerny <laughs> finally capitalize on that. <laughs> this is the wild fun part about next generation or just the game industry in general because you never know what are the bizarre talking points? Years from now, we'll look back and say, remember that time that Mark Stern had that PlayStation 5 live stream and he said that we might want you to take a picture or take video of your ear and send it into PlayStation <laughs> yeah. so we can better map the 3D audio to your specific uh. ear? It is bonkers in the best video game industry way. Yeah. Oh, that's also not not going to happen. Oh, absolutely. That, that's not how they're going to figure that out. <laughs> that's something that Mark Cerny said. Technically, this makes sense. And then the mm-hmm. Sony marketing team's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, how about you talk more about Jack 2 then, yeah. Mark? But it is, it is an interesting <laughs> yeah. idea that they have these very specific profiles that match with the inner workings of your ear. Yeah. And that they can kind of expand that in the future, you know? Do you think it would change if um, Serial finally used a Q-tip? Oh! oh. See, no. The rest of you were supposed to go, oh, with us. Come on. Oh, yeah. It's, well, it's hard you, to think up and stuff. You were just supposed to cry. Look, at it's, the it's one of those casualties. Sick burn that Hanson gave you. <laughs> That's right. So, speaking of sick burn, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one of the craziest parts of that stream, too, was when Mark Cerny was then talking about what I thought was a layup about talking about, like, oh, previous generations, here's how they did backwards compatibility. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, with the PlayStation 5, Here's how it's going to be working with PlayStation 4 Pro and PlayStation 4 backwards compatibility. All right, moving on to the next topic. It's like, oh my God, like it was built in a way that seemed tailor made for having the awesome takeaway headline of we're also doing PlayStation 3, PlayStation 2, PlayStation 1. They did not do it. Although on the slide, if you want to be a crazy conspiracy theorist, it looked like there was room. For yes, there was definitely room. That was what was weird to me. It was like they have the PS4 logos. There's room for two more logos, which are in the previous slide. So yeah. like, why don't they add? Or yeah. are they not going to? Well, that's I right. assume maybe, it's coming. It's just yeah. why they didn't announce. Maybe it, it was something that was taken out at the last second. Yeah, I wonder because I mean they obviously haven't shown the hardware yet, and so I wonder how hot a lot of the stuff is coming in for them. Yes. Uh, so yeah, and then the the end result of that is they announced that the top 100, P- well, most of the top 100 PS4 games ranked by playtime uh, are going to be compatible with the PS5. This is so this is really confusing better. actually, because like the way he said it made it sound like those are the games that are most compatible with the boost mode, which is a thing that's on PS4 Pro already. It makes your games run better with whether they're not like specifically engineered to run better. That's like putting on basically more powerful hardware. Then the PlayStation blog, blog later said, "Oh no, these are actually com- like what Serio was saying. These are the ones that are most compatible, or that are compatible for backwards compatibility." So I don't think Sony has a clear message on exactly on what that means. Yeah, and also, yeah, saying most of them will be available at launch. I understand PS4 is going to be the hardest to get up and running. I would imagine. But it is that weird thing of like, oh, I, I would be leaning towards, yeah, they're saving that announcement of full backwards compatibility for the entire PlayStation family for the future. Hopefully that happens. But then the fact that they're like, most of these PS4 games will run, then I'm like, oh no. Like, mm-hmm. is that going to be tricky then to get PS3 games up and running on this? Or does that yeah. just mean the further you go back in time, it's going to be easier, easier and easier? Yeah. yeah. I, it's also weird that like they, they, after saying like, hey, you know, kind, them kind of admitting that the PS3 was hard to de- develop for. Yeah. Uh, for them to basically use the same strategy for backwards compatibility, where it felt like it was they were doing kind of... Uh, specific software compatibility of like well we're going to check specific titles and then kind of add them over the course and then there will be a limited number of ti- of, of ps4 titles that'll be compatible versus you know what like the ps2 was able to do because he's like straight up mentioned yeah usually if you want direct compatibility you just put the other consoles chipset in there which is not what they're doing here so it felt like this weird winding pivot of like well this is what you would do if you wanted it we're not doing that instead we're gonna you know do it ad hoc, which is a, a weird message to to give. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to get uh, really nerdy, and, and hopefully you do, here's a real quick breakdown of what we know about the PlayStation 5 specs versus Xbox Series X specs. So the CPU, 
for the PlayStation 5 is, oh, it's going to be a lot of numbers, the 8X Zen 2 cores at 3.5 gigahertz, whereas the Series X is the 8 times Zen 2 cores at 3.8 gigahertz. GPU mm-hmm. for yeah, PlayStation. Yeah, that all sounds really good. Yeah. Okay, here we go. We got to do it, Kyle. This is next gen, baby. So <laughs> yes, PS5, I know we do. We do, we do. PS5's at 10.28 teraflops. Xbox Series X is at 12.16 teraflops. Um, let's see. Memory, it's going to be 16 gigabytes uh, of RAM for each. Memory bandwidth, uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's see. Other big takeaways. Uh, HDMI 2.1 for both, so it can handle 4K, 8K, all that stuff heading out. Um, let's see, expandable storage. It's the SSD slot, uh, PlayStation 5, and then the one terabyte expansion card that we talked about, proprietary for the Xbox Series X. Um, let's see, internal storage uh, for PlayStation 5. It's custom 825, 825 gigabyte solid state drive, where it's a one terabyte solid state drive for Xbox Series X. So right now at this point, Series X seems to have some of the numbers lead, you know, but as uh, our Lord and Savior's Digital Foundry pointed out, that might be trickier than you think to actually map out yeah. based on the strength of Sony's yeah. solid state drive. And especially when they were talking about, you know, all the different bottlenecks that Cerny was talking about and how all of those affect performance. And it's it's hard to get a sense of, well, okay, does that mean that the Xbox Series X might not be as powerful because are they addressing those bottlenecks? Or on the other hand, are they is Sony playing up these things when this is actually just going to be the next industry standard and the Xbox will have those things plus the extra, you know, spec numbers on there. Right. So uh, before all this on Monday, I believe it was, yeah, Microsoft revealed some new series or do details for the Xbox Series X. Um, they let Digital Foundry get their grubby hands all over the new mm-hmm. console and stuff. Um, and Kyle, this is, yeah, when you're talking about they were showing off the quick resume feature and what stood out to you now? That one of the examples that they used for a game to be quick resumed was uh, Ron Gilbert's The Cave. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, why? So they I mean, want, yeah, they wanted to show a Double Fine game because they own Double Fine. But the fact that they choose, yeah, oh, what is it? 20... I didn't even make that's duh. Okay, because I was just like, what? what? I mean, that game's fine. That that game's a solid seven. Yes, like... <laughs> yes, I beat it, and it's absolutely a solid seven. Yeah. yeah, but it's like maybe they just wanted to show a two D game. But the the part guess, that they were yeah. showing was well, they showed cool. a worry. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I guess you're right. But they're showing, yeah, State of Decay 2 and a bunch of other games and the quick resume feature, which apparently will go, uh, will save the state even if you shut off your console. But seeing that in action, I, I was really, really impressed. I thought it was awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm making jokes about the cave, a, a game that I actually do like. But like, I think that's an exciting thing. It's like one of those small things that like, I, I will absolutely use a lot yeah. because I do jump between games a lot. Mm-hmm. For our lifestyles, it makes a lot of sense of like yes. constantly playing different kinds of games over like over a two week period, we, we might touch five or six different games. So it's nice to be able to just switch between them without losing progress. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, even for most consumers, I imagine they have at least one, let's say, living game like a Destiny 2 or a Fortnite, right? And or a for them, or, yeah. yeah, for like any of those like long running uh, games, you can have that and then also be like, oh, I'm also working on, you know, a uh, Senua's Sacrifice or whatever it is, like a, a regular kind of like story based game that you're working through. And then you have to, you can switch to something else without kind of having to run that game from the beginning yeah although the live service games it seems like most of them just boot you back anyway because they have to reconnect and yeah. they kind of refresh everything yes but if this if the hard drives are to the point where load times are minimal anyway then i guess it, it doesn't matter as much yeah i mean it, like as an example i keep tetris effect installed on my ps4 just to play tetris occasionally so it's nice to not have to like turn off another game to just mm-hmm. play like a quick round of tetris yes yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they also showed just the comparison of uh, just load times in general, which it's always bizarre when they're showing load times for State of Decay 2 on an Xbox One X, which they, not that long ago, they're talking about being the powerhouse of the world. And mm-hmm. now you see it next right. to the Xbox Series X. And like, those load times were objectively bad for the One <laughs> X. So I was like, I don't yeah. know what the takeaway is here. I guess it's I'm like the EA the thing X. where every year EA was like, no, last year's sports game sucked. This year, <laughs> this year's this is the one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then other takeaways from Digital Foundry, they have an impressions video you should definitely check out. But uh, hey, they had this shocking revelation for me. You know, the glowing green light underneath the, the fan on the top of the Xbox Series X? I guess it's not like a light or an LED at all. It's just like a piece of green plastic. 
<laughs> that just looks oh, like mm. it's glowing. It's like, oh, that's kind of a bummer. But I guess that makes sense instead of having like this beam of green light coming mm -hmm. out of your Series X yeah. and stuff. Um, it looks like nice a... in photos. We'll see how it looks in person. But yeah, it, yeah, it seems right. cool. But they had I've like playing a Doom Eternal and Doom Eternal. Whenever they want you to go somewhere, it's always the green light somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I guess that just tells you where to progress from. Yeah, hey, it makes complete sense. Uh, also, the uh, they talk about like oh, the new controller. It's a little more elite inspired, where it has like textures on the triggers and stuff like that, which seems cool. Also, they talked about like how there's latency improvements with the new controller and playing on the Series X. But the cool thing is that if you use an Xbox one controller on the series x it'll actually update the firmware to have that same latency improvement mm. when you're playing on one x so the fun little the, yeah. details it, it also has a dedicated share button there's the start yeah. there's the hamburger the windows and then there's a third lower button that's specifically for sharing which yeah. i like i love that and yeah. now the hamburger has ray tracing which is good <laughs> <laughs> and the hamburger button will actually bring a hamburger to that's the right house it's too. a revelation yeah. oh, yeah. it'll, it'll postmates you a hamburger from they'll add that button. in a couple of months later like yeah, yeah, good, so. good, good exactly Hang on, uh, Imran, did you just bury the lead for this podcast? You've been playing Doom Eternal? I've been playing Doom Eternal, yeah. Oh my god, uh, none of us have a copy of it yet. Uh, we hope to cover it in depth next week. In addition to Animal Crossing, which we're going to be doing the deepest dive on, which is going to be external to uh, the Min Max Show podcast, will be on our YouTube channel. If you're a Patreon supporter for $5, you'll have the full audio version of that as well. But okay, how is uh, Doom Eternal, Imran? It's really, really good. As I like Doom 2016 fine. I thought like the second half of that game was a little repetitive. This game fixes those problems, and it also makes it a much deeper shooter than I honestly expected. Like, I don't know if we've talked about this before, but I played it last year at E3, and it was a... Uh, it's much more resource management heavy. Like, you are... You have a different number of different skills that will do different things, like get you health, get you armor, get you uh, more ammo. And you have to constantly manage and balance these skills and cools, cooldowns during big arena fights. Because if you don't, you will die, or you'll run out of ammo and just won't die anyway. So huh. Doom is like a lot more cerebral in that way of you have to constantly be aware of what is going on re with regarding your Slayer, of how you, you're doing on ammo, how you're doing against certain enemies. Do you prefer using Blood Punch against this one? Can you do not have a Blood Punch charge up? Can you, are you down on health and you need a glory kill? So it's a lot of that, and it ends up working out well for a, for a single-player FPS campaign as you can feel yourself getting better and better as time goes on to the point where by the end of the game, you're seeing these what the game calls heavy monsters that you fought at the beginning of the game that took forever to actually kill that yeah. you're killing in one or two hits not because your guns are stronger because you figured it out you figured the puzzle out is this a i hate to bring it up i'm sorry but do you think it's a little bit of that dark souls in the industry i could see it yeah i because like i talked to hugo martin a couple of months ago about it and he was saying what they one of the main design philosophies for doom eternal was they didn't want people to think that doom was just this point and shoot a uh, brainless shooter and now they're like they wanted to actually take it to a more cerebral level and i think absolutely like thinking about it from that perspective that game succeeded like crazy yeah for sure uh jeffem where's your hype level for doom eternal the reviews are glowing just as glowing as animal cross and you're still neck and neck but how are you feeling about it yeah i'm interested to check it out <laughs> hopefully hype that yep. is some hype right there you I guys mean, can't I, see I, it, I liked, but he's flailing I, his arms yes i liked <laughs> i liked the last one a lot too and so all all of this kind of information has me more excited about it too yeah so, yeah awesome it feels like it'll have a longer curve in terms of a, a longer learning curve overall because it feels like in doom it felt like you you found your kind of successful loop of okay i'm using the shotgun i i know when when to use the the chainsaw to basically refuel uh, and it feels like this is throwing a lot more like stuff that'll take up that bandwidth of like, okay, well, which of the you know x number of things that I can do should I do right now? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that'll that makes it easier to have a you know a fifteen twenty hour game versus Doom, where at some point, yeah, you it felt like you had your loop down, you had your favorite weapon, and you were just kind of going to town. And you know the monsters did definitely get harder, but it felt like okay, I've done. I figured the game out more or less, and the game is just giving me kind of scaling challenges adapted to that. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Well, hey, uh, you know, you know when you're about to go on a big flight and you feel like, oh, maybe traveling overseas. Remember those days? But you think like, okay, <laughs> what can I bring with me? What can I get done on this flight? You know, that feeling of like, I'm going to actually finish this game on Switch, or mm -hmm. I'm going to read this book mm -hmm. or read this comic book. I feel like the entire world is now in that state of like, what can I pack? What can I do to make the most of this time as we're all going to be kind of hunkering or bunkering down in our homes here? So we thought about like, hey, maybe we should share ways to get better during this time. Because my worst case scenario is think of it like a Christmas break, if you get one of those, a holiday mm -hmm. break, right? Where you go home, 
and then you just check Twitter 4,000 times and then it's like, oh, mm. and the holiday break's over and I didn't accomplish anything compared yeah. to like <laughs> the most memorable ones in my mind. Usually listen to like Giant Bombs, Game of the Year debates, but like the most like memorable ones for me are when I'm like, ah, that's the year I tackled this challenge or learned mm -hmm. to do this skill, you know, taking advantage of the situation instead of just letting it pass you by because this yeah. thing's going to go faster than you think probably for some people hopefully hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. uh so we've all kind of gathered some ideas i don't know what you all picked for just ways to get better during this period but jeff you seem like the healthiest out of any of us what are you up to <laughs> uh pers I, I mean really our kind of suggested voluntary lockdown just started so yeah i was i was out of town uh this past weekend we had a funeral to go to and so that didn't I have I haven't been practicing any of the things that we're about to talk okay we're going to talk about you'll yet. have some time yes. yeah yeah but yeah, just share a tip what do you got yeah uh the first one which you kind of already touched on is a thing not to do which is be on social media the entire time <laughs> oh my like, god really yes. take take this time consider it you know the government is basically telling you hey stay home like you have two weeks now you just have to hunker down also hunker down from the online world at this Please. point because it is going to be super hard super easy to just constantly be scrolling through checking out what the latest headlines are and things like that and it is it is a very it's a very dire place out in the physical world right now and it is it is 10 times worse online right now with the kind of stories that you're going to be seeing and the opinions and who's to blame for all those kind of things and so like really Try and limit your phone time and your computer time as much as you can. 100%. Like, it is wild. You know, last week when things, I feel like, really started to ramp up here, and at least in Minnesota, um, I realizing, like, hey, I'm starting to get pretty nervous. Like, I, it took me mm -hmm. a while to cancel my trip out to San Francisco for GDC, which I was supposed to be out at uh, this week. By the way, the community meetup is definitely canceled out there. I hope <laughs> I got that message to yeah. you, but I guess I haven't said it on the podcast yet. So please that don't. That not open anymore. Yeah. So. Okay, great. Yeah, don't meet <laughs> me out. outside uh, the Zeitgeist bar in San Francisco, <laughs> please. Not going to be there. But I, when I realized, like, I'm starting to get freaked out here. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm starting to lose it a little bit. I realized, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that was after a day of being glued to Twitter. It's just... Yeah. It is just panic in the worst way, you mm -hmm. know, and be smart, obviously, listen to the government's guidelines yeah. about exactly how to handle this. But if you stay glued to social media, you're going to lose your mind. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. It yes. genuinely is not good for you. And and it's it's especially a danger now because people are going to start, you know, going crazy, just being locked up in their house all the time. And so there that is Everyone has been conditioned at this point that when you have a moment of free time, you go to your phone and you check some kind of social media feed. Yeah. And so you're really going to have to try not to do that. Imran, mm -hmm. how are you doing on that front, man? I'm I'm still a social media monster, so I I probably mm -hmm. should take Jeffrey's advice and just cool down a little bit. But it's like, it, it feels easier to know that there are people out there also going through some shit. Mm -hmm. And it... I know, like, there, there's actually a, a tension point where you should not do that. But it, as somebody who's constantly who's worked from home for the last three years, it's using social media to see that other people are also like Hanson said earlier today that we're all having the same problems right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. is honestly a little comforting. I I hear you. Maybe maybe there's a way to limit it. Maybe it yeah, there's be, absolutely a threshold. You right know, there. checking in once a day, something mm -hmm. like that. Because I found myself. Yeah, going back to it more and more than I than I normally have. Um, and yeah. uh, yes, that that bonding thing is important to feel, but hopefully you can feel that by calling some loved ones or something a little yeah. more and healthy. There, there's also the difference between, I guess, social media where you can kind of control what kind of people you are interacting with, and and those people can give you comfort. Versus, I have been I have been refreshing news feeds a lot, mm. and you, and you're not getting a lot of heartwarming stories from your news feed at this point. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Kyle, do you have any hot tips over there? Um, so one of that I was, I have some about. Uh, I guess dealing sounds like a really negative word, but dealing with being home with a child for extended periods of oh, time. Oh, of course. Like, um, one, to get, because I kind of want to hear Imran's perspective on this, because you just made a really good point that you've been working from home for years at this mm -hmm. point. I'm new to it. I've only been working from home for like six months at this point. But like for people who are suddenly finding themselves at home a lot, I have found it really helpful over the past months and continuing now 
to like still wake up at a specific time and take a shower and get dressed, even though I don't have to, you know, yeah. like it's not a requirement. I can do the job that my day job now doing the, the other podcast is something I can do in my pajamas. Plug the podcast, Kyle. A, what's that? Plug the podcast name. Oh, uh, yeah. Gaming Ride Home podcast. Uh, check it out, please. I, I would love if you did that. But um, it be, waking up and getting dressed and just like treating the normal as the day as like a normal morning, like just helps me sort of just stay consistent like if you if you're just like well i don't have to get up i don't have to change i can just like go days here without taking a shower like i have found it has been healthy for me to keep up a um what's the word i'm trying to think Routine. of a uh yeah yes yeah, yeah. yeah so what about honestly uh, so like I, that and keeping your apartment clean is two of the biggest recommendations i would give because like yeah. if it's it's so easy to let it just get messy because you're like okay, i live here i live here this is not a huge deal but yeah. like I'm not going to be on camera. Yeah, <laughs> looking around and just going like, you know, this part's not on camera, but it, I should just at least pick up a bit around here. And in these situations where you're quarantined a bit and we can't leave, it's nice to just have a clean apartment or yeah. a clean house or whatever you're, you're living in. Yeah, so yeah. that was going to be one of my other tips, which is that basically since since your entire cosmos has been shrunk down to the home that you're living in now, yeah, kind of take that Take that extra time and really look around the environment that you're living in and do what you can to make it make you feel better at this point. And so part of that is giving things a good clean. I would say part of it is also decluttering wherever you can and just kind of find the objects in your house that make you the happiest and find ways to spotlight them around your environment like you have done around here. You know, mm. those those kind of things will just make you feel better. And it's really easy. I used to be the kind of person who would have the big pile of clothes on the floor and think like, well, I don't care. Like, that doesn't bother me. But when you actually get rid of that, you will be surprised by how much better that kind of makes you feel and yeah. less stressed out. 100%. Yeah, just like stupid things. Like, oh, I've had this beanbag half lodged underneath a couch in my bedroom for mm -hmm. a long time. I was like, I'm just going to get rid of that. I'm just yeah. going to get it out of this house and it feels so much better. Yeah, and I, I, the more conscious I have become of it, the more I realize when I'm doing those things where I'll just put something down and be like, no, I, I can take the extra five seconds and put that in the spot that it's actually going to be at because otherwise it's going to sit there for three weeks and that is going to have, you know, those kind of things have an unconscious effect on you when you are walking around them and especially in a time like this where you have to be at home and yet you're already under a bunch of stress that will kind yeah. of help yeah. you out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was thinking of uh, maybe I can tweet out the how to build a studio again. I made a video about building the MinMax studio, but something I've been thinking about is just it's an awesome time to learn a bit of tech. It's not that hard to record a podcast uh, with friends and you might say yeah. oh well it's weird to invite all the friends over like you know Imran you've been using it I believe we're kind of funny but there's a software called Zencaster it's just a site mm -hmm. you can use that will actually take your mic uh, and everybody's mics and then make one recording of it using a local audio file we didn't use it here because the video aspect gets out of sync and it's a complicated mess but if you just want to record <laughs> an audio podcast with your friends this is the perfect time to do it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's pent up. Everybody wants that connection. It's an awesome time to learn some of the tech. You don't need an expensive mic. If you want to be on the hardcore end, you could buy an expensive mic somewhere, I suppose. But you have some sort of microphone lying around your house and just get some recordings with your friends. You know, yeah. like I'm lucky here at MinMax where I get to have a lot of recordings with my friends and mm -hmm. even more so with like the Celebration of Fantasy 7 and stuff. But there's no excuse not to download even free software like OBS and learn how to stream, you know, make a connection yeah. that way. Like it's free, it's sitting there and I bet you have the tech to make it happen. I taught myself video editing in a night. Like it's easily something you can do to learn just a new skill because honestly you might as well. What else? Like teach yourself something you've always wanted to do because there's always going to be explanations and guides on the internet yes absolutely yep. i've been thinking about that too like software is is a huge one where it's like i've been meaning to relearn after effects for years i'm like oh this would be a good opportunity to go through those tutorials but even free software out there you know like we had um kobe soft joe in the studio a while ago here at minmax to show off uh, 3d animation and 3d rendering and, and sculpting and he uses uh blender which is free 3d modeling mm -hmm. software out there why not Download that and go through some tutorials and get some tangible skills, especially if it's somewhat related to your field of expertise. Like, there's no reason not to yep. anymore. Yeah, it's a it's a great time to start a new hobby. And another a kind of offshoot of that is, I would say, regardless of who you are, 
this is a good time to do a little journaling, I think, mm. which and and I would say get a notebook or or an actual physical one and write down your thoughts of what are going on now, because I think it will help you process things that you're going through right now. And it will also this is kind of an important historic time. It's huge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so having having a record of what you were thinking and feeling at those times, I bet will you will find value in that in the years. You're to come. going to be talking to your grandkids someday about this. Yes. You know, like you might as well have the best possible recording. Yeah. If it's a journal or if it's a podcast with your friends. Yeah. Honestly, like there's so many <laughs> yeah. options there. And also video game protagonists can figure out what happened to you. Yes. Oh, that's a very good point. That's a very <laughs> good point. Uh Serial, do you have any hot tips, man? Uh, I would suggest getting the number of your grocery store and calling them every day to see if they have toilet paper. Okay, cool, uh, cool, yeah. It, it, it helps. At some point, they have to relent. No, um, <laughs> I invested early. I was smart. Yeah. Uh, it's not like it's, I, I mean, I've been working at home for a while since, you know, even at Game Informer, I work Saturdays. Uh, so, like, uh, having one thing that I did very early on was just have, like, exercise equipment around my apartment mm. just to be able to use it so I can't ignore it. I can't say, like, oh, I need to go to the gym. Um because uh, when I was losing weight, that was something that I kept in mind of um, trying to do this for the long term. And so there, I knew that if I went to a gym, there would be days where I did not want to go. Uh, and so having that stuff at home definitely helps. Maybe n- not so helpful now because I don't know if you'd be able to order anything online at this point. But um, but definitely having that kind of exercise routine to help you to – there are things you can do at home. You can do uh, a lot of cardio. You can do like push-ups, uh, sit-ups, et cetera. Um, if you have like – Ring Fit Adventure, which I guess is now going for like ridiculous prices online because people have, you know, glommed on to the fact that it's pre- actually pretty good in like indoor exercise. Yeah. Um, you know, get back into that if you're if you've been doing that. Um, I've been watching a lot of uh, movies while pedaling on an exercise bike. So like just having uh, that kind of stuff to, you know, do exercise and watch something that you've been meaning to watch for a while at the same time. I think that stuff uh, works really well. Yeah, here's a here's a bold vision for you, Serial, that I've been uh, doing more and more because you know I got into weightlifting this year, but I eventually hurt myself too bad, so I've been trying to slow down. That. But I have a new one, which is doing squats. Good, mm-hmm. I don't do them enough. Mm-hmm. Here's a very specific tip: microwave squats. Every time mm-hmm. you're microwaving something. Just start doing squats in your yeah. kitchen. It's the perfect <laughs> yeah. period of time. Usually it's like minute 40 to get that tea water hot, minute 40 for my oatmeal in the morning. Microwave squat, squats, ladies and gentlemen. Squat them out. Yeah. <laughs> squat and if, them if out. you're playing like an online game, if you're looking for a match in Fortnite, those are perfect times to just uh, start doing some push-ups or whatever exercise you want. Like while you're waiting, if you whatever game you're playing has a long respawn timer, like yeah. if you're waiting between rounds of Warzone or whatever. Uh, that's a good time to just start doing some exercise randomly and keep in shape, you know? So that you're nice and out of breath. Of seven? What's that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Never During mind. the squat minigame of F7. Yes, squats. exactly. While exactly. you wait for April 10th to roll around. Does anybody yeah. else have any other tips they want to send out in the world here? Uh, yeah. Introduce your child to Minecraft. Now's the right <laughs> time to do it. Uh, my kid has gone all in on Minecraft, and she has a friend that she calls who's playing it on iPad. It's yeah. all cross-play now. Yeah. It's been great. She's yeah, like she's blowing been... up mountains with TNT and riding horses around. It's it's phenomenal. She was waiting for the ray tracing update, right? Like she was only <laughs> going to play it with ray tracing. So that was a good time. But it is it is that thing of like, you know, because her friends don't have a dad who's obsessed with video games, but it is very easy. Like what she's been doing is just FaceTiming her friend who has Minecraft on their iPad. And I'm able, I was able to get them connected and they're playing online together, which is like, you know, yeah, it's a pretty easy suggestion. But um, I mean... It's been great, and she's been digging it. And I and I consider Minecraft to be like a creative game, so I don't feel so bad if she plays it for extended periods of time. You know? Yeah, hundred percent. The uh, another game I was thinking about that'd be great for this time. It kind of ties into what I was talking about about learning software. But I know we talk about it too much. But Dreams, I think, would be an amazing mm, game to download yeah. right now. It's what forty bucks on PS4. Not yeah. only do you get infinite interesting <laughs> weirdo games, uh, but then also at the same time you would learn a lot about the basics of game design and even programming by yeah. going through those tutorials. Yeah, go through all the tutorials for sure. Yeah. That, that's a great one. Uh, and basically, if you are quarantined now with a loved one, you can couch co-op, playing a couch co-op game or uh, otherwise board games if you're into board games. Like this is this is a great time to set, to set aside more time to do those kind of things together. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Favorite two-player board games? Yeah. Um, 
There are, yeah, there are a bunch True. of them. They they have become more popular over the years. Um, I think Patchwork is a good one. That one's solid. I bought it uh, a little overhyped in my mind, but solid. It, yeah, I guess it depends on how much you like the Tetris angle of it. I I'm, love Tetris, yeah. but yeah, yeah, it's it's good for two player one. I think I fell into the rut of overthinking two player board games. Where at a certain point, I'm like, you know what, the best two player board game of all time is. It's chess. Like, just why not pick up chess? Imran, you laugh. Is that not true? No. Chess is true, yeah. I, I was I was laughing because I was thinking one of the things I wanted to do during this, like, time is get really into a fighting game. That's Ooh. very similar. Like, just learn. I, the thing has always been, like, I'll get to something too complicated, like a combo that I just don't understand or can't execute, and I just sort of give up. Right. This might be the time to just, like, push through and learn what, what the best fighting game for me is actually is out there yeah so were you thinking uh jump force probably yeah that's oh, obviously, obviously the one yeah. to learn yeah that's <laughs> that was everyone's problem with it it's too good <laughs> yeah. i didn't want to learn it later i think it's a good time for grand blue honestly like that yeah. Game, oh, yeah. came out like people are still getting into it it might be the time to for me to get over whatever hump is keeping me from winning online and yeah. play more of it spawn just came out in mortal Kombat, so you know you mm -hmm. can learn him yeah yeah that's a good one well hey good tips everybody anything else anybody wants to throw in the bucket uh, real quick, I thought of this to jump off of Serial's tip. Uh, I wanted to plug, there's a feature for Washington Post, their launcher website. Yeah. Called Sweat Into the Load Screens, A Guide to Working Out While Playing Video Games. Ooh. That was written by Derek Swinhart, uh, <gasps> Game Informer's most muscular mm -hmm. intern. He is most a... powerful, for sure. Yeah. Yes, most powerful uh, intern who he also does like glass about. blowing art and stuff. What a, what a cool guy. Yeah, <laughs> very cool guy. All right, definitely check that out. That's yeah. awesome. Also, uh, you know, it's a good time, you know, a... a third of min max is devoted to, to getting better overall so um keep us updated uh, mm -hmm. leave a leave a comment on our patreon page if you support us in any tier then we'll read your comment or question on the show and let us know what you're getting better at during this time i think that'd be really helpful yeah and and whatever you're doing just prioritize things that make you happy when whatever you it doesn't necessarily have to be a new thing but you should be now is a time to be thinking more about your mental health, and it's one of the kind. Of, it's a kind of thing where it, these kinds of anxiety and stress that we are all under now, as a as a big wide world, uh, those kind of things can sneak up on you. And so, whatever whatever reading a book or whatever else makes you happy, just set aside some extra time for that, because basically it's, the government is telling you to do that now. They're, it's they're, easy they're to dismiss how much this can actually affect your anxieties and how much it can affect your mental health. And it's a lot of people we have the tendency as a culture to go, oh, that's not a thing that I really think about or care about, or that's not a thing that like really affects me. But no, it does. You're just like everyone else, and you should be able to take the time to practice self-care, mm -hmm. especially yeah. in terms of how you deal with these sort of things. Yeah, because this is really unprecedented now. We, we don't have anything to compare it to. So it's new for all of us, and it's weird and kind of scary. And just take some time. make Check in on your loved ones as well and make sure they're doing well good yeah. yeah for sure i'm not don't physically don't physically go to their house and knock on their door but <laughs> yeah, well you can't knock on the other side i think yeah. is the way that works right? <laughs> oh, yeah. like my sister <laughs> drove like three and a half hours to go visit my grandma but like mm -hmm. you can't get into the old folks' home, so she just like banged on the glass outside. It's like, all right, I guess that's Hello. something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My, I just uh, want to let you know I'm here. <laughs> my apartment building is doing a really nice thing where like we have just an email chain where because there's a couple of elderly people who live in this building, so people who have cars are saying, well, who needs things? I'm gonna go out and make a run, mm. and then they just drop it off in front of the door, and that's the extent of it. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a very nice thing. I've still never met my neighbors, but I've talked to them on email several times now of who yeah. needs things and. That's probably a good way to kind of make some social distancing communication in these days. Yes, hundred percent. Um, Imran, what do you think about the effects of the coronavirus on the industry? As a as a newsman, uh, what oh, stands boy. out to you? That is a very large question. Like I saw a tweet right before we started recording that Final Fantasy VII is still coming out, still having a release date. Uh, but there's Square is saying you probably will not get a physical copy that day. Right. Some people had Which emailed is, in or, or wrote in to the Patreon saying, "Hey, what's going on? I got an email that my uh, that the Amazon package isn't going to be arriving anymore. Does this mean that Seven's delayed?" And it turns out, no, it's just labeled as a non-essential item from Amazon, so they might not be shipping yeah. it. And that that's one thing. But like, there's so many. I was thinking about this the other day. Like, Best Buy in the last couple of years had a thing where they kind of revolutionized their online site by making it so you could buy. Buy things from the website and they get shipped out from the store. And mm -hmm. that's how stuff got to you so fast. If stores start closing down across the country, then that shuts down. So 
online like retailers are not gonna be able to sell games from there. Like I'm confident stuff in March, April was gonna come out. After that, it gets a lot more dicey. Like I'm, I'm honestly not can, not concerned, I should say, but like I'm interested to see how stuff like Animal Crossing and Doom Eternal sells this Friday, because like you can't physically go to a store in San Francisco and buy stuff anymore. They're mm-hmm. non-essential businesses barring some other businesses that are still mm. open we'll, for some reason. We'll get to that but, in a bit. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I wonder if that evens out, though, just with the amount of people that are craving a good meaty game like Doom Eternal or Animal Crossing 2 and they'll yeah. buy it digitally. But do you think um, there were theories that, okay, with all the factories shutting down in China, this might delay the next generation of consoles? I think that if they things are not fixed by summer, then absolutely. Like, they're, they might launch with weaker numbers, which is going to affect a lot of things, especially like publisher targets, because they assume so many numbers are going to be, so many install bases are going to be set by that point that they don't have to worry about it. But I would think that if they can't manufacture that many, they probably won't manufacture any. So it's it's a larger question of, we just don't know yet. We don't know what it's going to look. Two weeks ago, I wouldn't say that we'd be on lockdown in Disco. But this is where we are now. So who knows what two months from now is going to look like. It's going to be so wild. And thinking about, okay, if they do delay next gen, but maybe the development of Halo Infinite is still moving along enough that it's like, okay, do then they just release the Xbox One X version of Halo Infinite or do they hold everything? Because yeah, the big thing is, you know, I saw Jason Schreier tweeting a lot about it as well, is just so many developers now are probably really in the middle of it for trying to get these games ready for next gen yeah. and now when it's like all right if the studios are being responsible it's like all right everyone work from home we can try and do this remotely that but has like, to have any because like you can't take a ps5 dev kit home or at least everyone can't right. like it's what a lot of those places outsource to china or they outsource the studios that are just not in their offices anymore yeah and it's a like there's a lot of next gen games if you don't work directly for sony and microsoft you probably don't have the resources to make those games right now and there's a larger thing of We've never been in a situation where games as a service had to stop. Right now, people are playing Fortnite, but Fortnite's gonna, not going to be updated for too long. If something breaks in Warzone, or who's going to fix it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's insane to think of a team with 100 people, and they're all just going to go home and work, you know, on on what, their home computers, their laptops? Do they take their computers with them? How, how do you keep, you know, a... a f- output flow of yeah. work and coordinate everyone online oh those oh i feel so sorry for everybody in it trying to line up everything <laughs> for all these oh, studios God. yeah kyle trying yeah. to get your mic work- working has taken cumulatively 14 hours this week just imagine trying to build a game on this <laughs> i feel like it was like 30 minutes yeah but, but still but still um but it, it does make it kind of striking that xbox announced today that they're shipping the series x and th- uh thanksgiving this year yeah. yeah that's a real commitment and i feel like they mm-hmm, came yeah. out of there intending to make that a bold statement but it's kind of like a color tugging thing of like hmm i don't know that you guys can commit to that quite yet yeah but, i well, wonder because it, it feels like thanksgiving 2020 if they since they didn't give it a specific date it feels like it's going to be like a time range just to tell you like hey mid to late november maybe early december well aren't they saying uh, that so thanksgiving this year is thursday november 26th right you don't think they're saying that directly they're just saying thanksgiving era yeah. i i think so if you're gonna, that day. yeah i i think if you were going to go for an exact date you would have said november thanksgiving november 26th i think they're giving themselves a little bit of leeway by just saying thanksgiving i think it's going to come out in that quote-unquote time frame and do you think they're doing that today just to try and step on the PlayStation 5 news, which was Maybe, a little murky? Like, that's, yeah, that's totally feasible, yeah. Wild. Um, so a company that uh, is not doing the right thing is uh, GameStop. To be fair, all of our yeah. former... <laughs> that's uh, been their motto for a wait, long time, though. Hold on. <laughs> GameStop not doing something right? Yeah. So uh, Kotaku and Vice have written articles just outlining the... I guess, brutal state of things within GameStop uh, these Mm -hmm. days with the coronavirus that they are staying open. Even when states have said, hey, all non-essential stores, please close down. GameStop has said, ah, we're going to stay open. And it's clearly to the point of just trying to make money, which I understand Mm -hmm. they could probably use money at this point, but it is to the point of, all right, you are possibly costing multiple human lives here for the sake of trying to stay open to make some profits off of Doom and Animal Crossing on Friday, right? Is that all what's going on here, if you boil it down? 
I mean, also it's a quarantine, so people are looking for games to play, which also means that people like that go, those stores are picked over. So people are looking through, like they're shuffling through boxes with their hands to look for whatever is left, and that's like oh, it's such an insane thing. Like it also, we we got a couple of weeks ago that store those stories about GameStop like new initiatives for social gatherings which are things that they can't do anymore. So mm -hmm, what is yeah. their long-term strategy right now? Yeah, so they, they could it, not have picked the worst time to make that pivot. <laughs> well, and it's <laughs> just in they Tulsa. They still have to expand and everything like that. But at the same time, you know, they did cancel the launch events for Doom and Animal Crossing, which is yeah. one move in the right direction. But they had, um, they had a big statement going out saying, hey, we're providing sanitizer, uh, hand sanitizer, and uh, medical or like cleaning supplies to all the stores to make sure it's tip-top shapes everybody can still come in and buy some games and trade in their used games tech trades are hot these days um but then reports are coming through uh with kotaku and vice and other places talking about how that's all bullshit. uh yeah. and they haven't sent any supplies because they can't buy it and they've just told the stores go out and buy it yourself and then we'll reimburse you but the people at the stores can't go buy it because there's none on the shelves anywhere so all these stores are just going unclean there's been like demo stations uh in the stores that They've shut off some, but the ones that are paid for, they're required to leave those on from GameStop corporate. And so people are just grabbing that controller and there's no way to clean it because everybody's out of cleaning supplies. Mm -hmm. And you think about when you go into a store like that, how many game boxes that you pick up to look at and read the back of it and everything and then just put it mm -hmm. back on the shelf. Yeah. Take a picture of it to use in a game later. later. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. true. Um, but my question is, I, I, I don't know, I... I'm in at the in fear of acting like devil's advocate like is this a GameStop issue or is this a retail issue like so, are all retail stores kind of having this bad reaction to this or is GameStop like being worse than others so right now you can stay open for most places as long as you believe you are doing a community good or an urgent uh ne community necess necessity so like supermarkets Game are open but yes. like are clothing Bank. stores open uh, uh, by and large, I do not think so. Okay. But okay. like right now, for most of the country, it is voluntary. GameStop yeah. is deciding that they are doing a community necessity. I do not think that's true. I do not think that they are in the right place to make that call, and they're making it purely from the perspective of profit. And yeah. that's one of the, like the right thing to do, even though they're not legally mandated to do it, is to shut down and give all their employees paid leave. But they're not doing that, and I can understand from their from the purely capitalistic perspective why they're not doing that. But from a PR, from a humane perspective, it's the wrong from the move. keeping people alive perspective. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's brutal too, because I mean, in those articles, they talk about like, oh, if somebody tested positive for the virus or was sick with probably the virus, even if they weren't tested, and then they were sent home, they're like, oh, the stores are remaining open. It's like, okay, now it's just like all those former coworkers are just going to keep working and keep interacting with people. And they say that like, oh, we've set up guidelines to try and have people keep their distance within the stores themselves as well. But uh, here's a quote from the Vice article saying, no stores in my area have received cleaning supplies or hand sanitizer. On two different conference calls, we were told we had to quote, Think about the longevity of the business and that GameStop would have to close stores permanently if we closed for health reasons. So they basically guilted us into working or we will lose our jobs anyway. Mm. And they're That's still taking great. cash too, which is like an insane thing to do in this at this point in the, the pandemic. Like just only take cards, but have no re interaction between the... Like because the clerk has to actually grab the disc in the back and like put it in there. So there's one vector right there. If you're giving them cash, then like if you have it, then you're spreading it honestly through whatever like money is not literally laundered it has to like go through various hands yeah it yeah. just it seems like a, a complete mess and it's just getting to the point as society it's like you can't you can't play it safe enough here right mm -hmm. and yeah. so the fact that they're going forward with it it's just going to look worse and worse and worse and it's just disgusting yes, it is yeah. it is not a good look and it is hard to make the argument that you're doing something for the social good when anyone can already download a game straight from their console granted mm -hmm. internet speeds <laughs> vary right mm -hmm. definitely definitely a yeah. factor but just for the sake of the employees i mean literally think of how many people are coming into those stores it's a guarantee that there will be a death because of these game store stores being open right mm -hmm. yeah I mean, it's it's tough because, like, obviously all of us have a very complicated relationship with GameStop. And right. it's, like, it's it's hard for us not to immediately jump to, like, oh, they're doing it wrong. But it's, like, it's it's there's no counter-argument here. 
<laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. They need to shut down and it's it's I mean, going to hurt them, but it's like that's that's everyone's experiencing that. Right? Yeah, there's a yeah. larger thing there of yes, honestly, most of the industries are going to shut down after this. Like if this lasts more than a couple of weeks and by all accounts is going to, then a lot of restaurants, businesses, clothing stores, retail like any kind of retail store there there's going to be a lot of empty storefronts when this is all said and done. And I think GameStop is worried they're going to be it's hastening their eventual demise but it's hastening it for a lot of people yeah. and it's better to be alive and rebuild than the alternative yeah right. for sure and it's sad it's sad to see them instead of like kind of quietly acknowledging it that they're in the mood where they're kind of like desperately flailing to figure uh, that stuff out and that includes kind of basically doing wrong by both their employees and their customers at this point yeah, Jeez. yeah for sure so hey GameStop. Please just shut down like the rest of the world. Please do us all a favor here. We're all doing our best. Um, but hey, you guys want to have some fun again? Please. Sure. Yeah. 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 You ready, Jeff? I'm here comes the tickle party. Oh, oh. no, we can't do that I mean, anymore. Oh, no, no, no. Six feet apart tickles. Six feet Don't worry. Apart. I, I have very pole. long tickle extenders. Mm. Anyways, okay. You know <laughs> how Dr. sometimes Susan? sometimes games are released on the same day? Uh, like, for example... March 20th, coming up on Friday. Very exciting day where Animal Crossing mm -hmm. and Doom were released on the same day. Um, I was looking for a historical rundown of the biggest days in video game history mm -hmm. where multiple games released on the same day. Now, you could go to every console launch. I don't think mm -hmm. that's as fun. Yeah. There might be a couple of those trickling in here, but I'm talking about weird coincidences where different publishers, sometimes the same publisher, end up releasing games on the exact same day. Right. Uh, it is crazy how some of these have have happened and, and it's weird too it's a tough thing to google so i want to thank everybody that responded i tweeted just asking for examples and people have uh, come in with some great great deep cuts that they just remember there's also a lot of people being like i remember picking up this and this at the same time at a midnight launch event it's like oh, technically a week apart also right. with europe the dates are a little bit in flux for some of these uh and they remember it differently but <clears throat> uh okay here's how it's gonna work we're gonna go through It'd be cool if you guys could try and guess with the dates what the games released on that date are. And then I think the game is, let's figure out who won that date ultimately. Okay. Which game has the strongest lasting legacy? Which game had the biggest cultural impact on gaming? Not which game you prefer, not which game you think is better, but which has stood the test of time and had more of an impact. Beautiful. Sound good? Mm. Great. Uh, all right. Do we all remember October 9th, 2012? Do you want us to like buzz in with a guess? Just go ahead. Yeah, it's it's so not a game is, show. Okay, Red I have game? a. This is just the one that I thought of when I saw you tweet that, and I think it might have happened around this time. Is it Diablo three and Max Payne three? Interesting. No, that was May fifteenth, okay. twenty twelve. Max Payne three versus Diablo three. There, uh, and you okay. know Diablo three saying it launched on that day. It's a little bit messy because there's a whole error and yeah. all that stuff. Well, yeah. I have a, a distinct memory of that. My wife was very excited for Diablo three, and she was just livid because she could not play. And I was like, like literally sitting next to her on the Xbox, I was like, well, I get to play Max Payne three. I've been really excited about this game. <laughs> I'm sure that was but great. I think, I think one of those have stood the test of time longer than the other. I mean, it's just it's Diablo three, right? Yeah. Yes. I, mm -hmm. Yeah. As much as I love Max Payne three, yeah. Yeah, and people, I mean, it got good reviews, but I feel like. Talk about games that have kind of dropped off the radar. I don't feel like anybody's talked about Max Payne 3 for uh, five years. Uh, Leo Vader won't shut up about the multiplayer. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> shout out to Leo. Okay, this is another one. This is the other one from 2012, Kyle. October 9th. This is Dishonored. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was uh, going to say maybe a little hint other than the date. but no, Yeah, this, you're right. This is so Dishonored, Dishonored versus... Dishonored versus... Mass Effect SSX. Nope. XCOM Enemy Unknown. Mm. This is a big day. And uh, one of my favorite things really broke my heart in a sweet way is when I tweeted that out asking for dates. Jake Solomon, creative director from XCOM, responded. And he said, hey, I'll always feel a connection to Arcane and Harvey Smith because of the fact that we launched on the same day. But that was very sweet. Um, okay. Which has a greater legacy? Dishonored or XCOM one. Enemy Unknown? Uh, it's gotta be XCOM, I think right? it's XCOM. Just I think it's XCOM, yeah. I think it is. Just for the number of, of XCOM clones at this point, kind of revitalizing yeah. turn-based combat. Yeah, just just that, and just that kind of whole menu style and, and 
treating tactics games in that way. I, I think they got they found a really modern format for how you display all of that information that I think we've seen yes. across a large swath Absolutely. of games. Incredibly smart. Uh, okay, but uh, the but the emerge we shouldn't just rush past like the emergent action kind of game or you know immersive like, sim yeah, immersive sim immersive sim yeah which yeah. which they have done a lot of those arcane specifically and i think that has become more popular too but but not comparable not to, to xcom yeah. yeah uh okay going back in time a little bit october 14th 2003 kyle this is your day i've never seen a more kyle day 2003. Yes, one of the games released we've talked about earlier on this episode. Is there a Halo uh, game man. in there? Yeah, I'm going to need a little. Um, so that, that it, I can think of, so that okay. I was like a junior in high school. Yeah, so like it is two think. sequels. The second entry, well, let's just start simple. This is the second entry to a PlayStation 2 series. Is it uh, Jack 2 and The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker? Wind no, Waker would have been earlier in the it year. Is, yeah. It is Jack 2. It is Max yeah. Payne 2, and it is Mega oh. Man X7. <laughs> oh, nice. I, I played all three of those. <laughs> <laughs> all right, X7 Kyle. is real bad. Which X7 one? is the worst Mega Man X game by a yes. mile. Yes. I mean, I guess yeah. it's strange. I made this game last night, and now talking about which has the greatest cultural impact. The fact that Jack 2 was <laughs> broadcast <laughs> to millions of people today, it has to be Jack 2, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, not mean, exa- I, it's not exactly like most of these are in a lower weight class. Uh, previous contestants but yes i would say that of those it's probably jack too all right yeah. there it is uh okay that's this... a good one wow all three of those the same day isn't okay, that cool. wild all right uh this is november 15th 2011 this is two games from the same publisher hmm. one of them is oh boy an ongoing series with a bunch of entries and this is the third entry in a sub-series within that series. Oh, oh gosh. 2011? Battlefield? Is no. it an Assassin's Creed situation? Yes, it is. Which one? Uh, that one would be... Brrr... No, that, that one's Revolutions. Revelations, yes. Revelations. Revelations. Yep, okay. November 15th, and Ubisoft decided to put it up against uh, Rayman Origins on the exact same day. Oh, oh really? That's yeah, fine, Rayman actually. doesn't That's so different. with release dates in, in terms of what it goes against. Yeah, it's got a tough go. But, uh, I mean, Rayman Origins, do you think, is standing the test of time? Obviously, Assassin's Creed is huge. Revelations was not that pivotal, I, mean, I feel like, in the history yeah. of the series. Revelations Revel- was when it started to get like, oh, wait, none of these are really mattering all that much. Right. Yeah, that was the first one that I felt like I was like, well, I guess I should finish this. You yeah. know, Brotherhood I loved, but Revelations, I was like, eh, I guess I'll see this to the end. Yeah, congratulations, Rayman Origins. You won that day. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. This I one... do. I will. I mean, Legends just totally wipes the floor with Origins for me. Like, mm-hmm. I, I like. You know what I mean? It almost like deletes Origins. Uh, <laughs> wow. I like. You know, I don't like, install it. Don't install it. I think <laughs> I, I like it more, but at the same time, I like some of the Murphy stuff in Legends. I think I like Origins just for like the purity of just pure platforming. Fewer games. Yeah, but overall. man, Legends has the music levels. I look. You no doubt, Legends, Legends is better, and Legends is great. But okay, here we go. Also, what it has about most of Origins in it? What's that? That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's the other reason. That's right. Oh my god. Uh we have September 1st, 2015. Okay. Let's see. Um mm. Chris Zimmer was the voice director for both games. <laughs> this is not helpful. <laughs> is, is one of the Metal Gear Solid 5? It is. Metal Gear Solid 5 Phantom Pain released on September 1st, 2015. The other is oh, developed in Sweden. Mad Max and Mad, Metal Gear yeah, Solid. Oh. Yeah. Um, I mean, so Mad Max has the bigger cultural impact. I think. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's a yeah. solid game, but yeah. Metal Gear Solid Five, undeniable, right? It's a yeah. real the cave. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what about November eighteenth, two thousand two? This is two games from the same publisher, the same series. Metroid Prime and Metroid. Fusion. There it is, because they interconnected. Oh, yeah, good call. Uh, Metroid Prime, is that just a slam dunk there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Uh, I love Fusion, though. No doubt, Fusion? it's great. Uh, November 18th, 2014. Oh, boy, how do I give November clues? 18. One of them was Game Informer's Game of the Year. <laughs> okay, 2014 no, uh, Game of the Year. <laughs> uh, sh- uh, 
a Middle Earth Shadow of uh, No, that's Mortar. what it should have been, Serial Vasquez. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Dragon Quest, right? Dragon, Dragon Quest, Dragon Age, Dragon Age, Inquisition. Dragon Quest Inquisition, Dragon Games, Dragon Quest right. Inquisition against uh, a Ubisoft open world game, the fourth. <laughs> Far Cry? Far Cry 4 versus mm-hmm. Dragon Age Inquisition. Now, I know Far Cry 3 is obviously the most influential of the most recent We're Far not going to give it to Dragon Age anyway. So just give it to Far yeah. Cry 4? Yeah. All right, there Far Cry had like four sequels. Yes. <laughs> like five and it's, it, it's become part of like uh, Ubisoft's like overall template for making games at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, from the people who brought you Far Cry matters more than the people who brought you Anthem. Well, certainly well, today. Dragon Age Inquisition, <laughs> tricky. Okay, what about... Nine nine ninety nine, September 9th, ninety nine. Sonic Adventure. Correct. So there is that. Final Fantasy eight. There it I is. We weren't doing. Oh really? Okay. Yes. So Wait, we got... Sonic Adventure. I thought we weren't using a, a console launch game. Well, if we're pitting up against each other, but technically yeah. it was um... Soul Calibur, Power Stone, and Sonic Adventure launched on that day. Okay. But also Final Fantasy eight. Let's just take Final Fantasy eight versus Sonic Adventure. Imran, biggest cultural impact. Honestly, it's probably Sonic. I think yeah. Final Fantasy VIII is a much better game, but like Sonic Adventure was how a lot of kids got into that series at that time, and those kids are now voting age. Hundred so. <laughs> yeah. uh, percent. So okay, I, it's it's funny the nine nine ninety nine thing. I was just thinking about the other day randomly. I was like, oh, what a great day that that was to release something. New. I will yeah. always remember the Dreamcast came out nine nine ninety nine, and I was like, man, it's going to be a long time before we ever get a like consistent set of numbers like that like we had skyrim on 11 11 11 yeah. you know but it's Devil like May Cry 3 switch came out on february 2nd 2020 well uh, <laughs> close 222 20, two, two, okay yeah so we'll we'll get that okay yeah 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 uh kyle do you remember what uh, elder scrolls came out against on 11 11 11 oh man i probably picked both up at midnight whatever uh, it might have been maybe you did mention it earlier in the episode of the midmax show here <laughs> Was it Saints Row the third? No, it is one of the oh. greatest games of all time. On 11, 11, 11? Yep, it went 1.0 on 11, 11, 11. Minecraft? Minecraft! Mm. There we go! Oh. Yeah, I was not at a midnight opening to pick up Minecraft. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is... I think this is the greatest release date of all time in terms of cultural impact, double whammy, Skyrim, yeah. and Minecraft. I know Minecraft's a little bit mushy in there since it was out before um in so many ways but i mean you have to give it to minecraft and that seems insane when you're putting it up against skyrim i do it's funny that is the last like midnight opening i remember attending was skyrim oh really to go pick up a game i don't know that i have gone i think i picked up metal gear solid 5 at like 11 p.m but yeah anyway that's an aside very aside okay what about same publisher same series again on 11 11 2014 same Different generations. Assassin's Creed Rogue and Unity. There it is. Way to oh, go. And smart. I guess Unity, is that the one that's patched to a decent state now? But in terms of cultural impact, people still remember the effed up face more than anything specifically from Rogue. Yeah. 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 Uh, what about uh, March 24th, 2003? Imran, you mentioned it earlier. March 2003. That would have been Wind Waker, but something else I don't know. Yeah. Now, this is what I like to call a juggernaut. This is Amplitude on PlayStation 2 versus <laughs> Wind Waker. No. I think we don't even have to debate that one. It's clearly yeah. Amplitude. Moving on. <laughs> right. Okay, this is maybe the second biggest release date overlap I could find from people submitting their suggestions. October 27th, 2017. Do you remember? So is October... Is that a Mario Odyssey? Yep, correct. Mario yeah, Odyssey is right. one of them. Do you remember what the other two games are? Two. Yep. Uh, was it Assassin's Creed Origins? Yes. Way to go, Serial. And the last one. And then one... Uh, Wolfenstein. Yeah. Uh, the New Colossus. Yep. Mm, Wolfenstein okay. 2. Yeah. Wow. All right. Boy, what do you think? Cultural <laughs> impact. Mario Odyssey, Wolfenstein 2, Assassin's Creed Origins. Mario I think, Odyssey. I think it's. I'm kind of leaning Assassin's Creed. I think. I'm I'm, I mean, like, personally, it's yeah. Mario for me, but, like, I feel like Origins has set Assassin's Creed on this weird new path. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the RPG like, path, uh, which is which was more impactful than Mario. As much as I loved it, you know, I think yeah. I'm with you. I think, and just in terms of like updating a game and just those massive releases, yeah, I think it's Origins. Uh, okay, uh, Serial, this one's for you, buddy. Mm-hmm. Uh, April nineteenth, twenty eleven. Uh, that would be 
Mortal Kombat and Portal 2. Yes, Mortal Kombat 9 versus wow. Portal 2. And yeah. Mortal Kombat 9, great reboot, but, well, actually, Serial, what do you think? What, what has had a more bigger, like, had a bigger impact on the industry overall? Uh, I feel it's probably Mortal Kombat in really? terms of, like, that first game, I think, definitely set a new bar for story modes in, in fighting games, which fighting games mm -hmm. have been trying to ape ever since. Uh, and I don't know that I, I can point to a lot of games inspired by Portal 2 in any yeah. significant well, way. There's maybe point Quantum to any Conundrum. good game that came out after <laughs> I'll, I'll, Portal 2. I'll say, oh, we should just right. be good, is what they all took away from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wait, our writing should be funny and good. Yeah. I mean, Mortal not Kombat, even Valve like, followed up Portal 2, so... <laughs> Mortal Kombat definitely, like, heralded this thing of... Like, Street Fighter started it, of we need 3D, 3D graphics and 2D planes and that's right. how fighting games are going to be right now then moral cow was like also yeah now we're going to go back to that we're going to yeah. make this the new thing and that that's what fighting games have been since then yeah, yeah and just be, being feature rich in a way that i think a lot of uh traditional fighting games weren't being and that the, you you had the the challenge tower you had actually uh you had like this kind of emphasis on online play and uh yeah like that story mode i think it's is it's it's not even like my favorite story mode in a fighting game but like in terms of Oh, this is a this is a new approach to doing these kinds of things, and not just having like, well, here's the arcade mode with a bunch of endings for every individual yeah. character. Mm -hmm. Stringing a bunch of fights together with some cutscenes ended up being like the best thing they could have done with that franchise at that moment. Yeah. Uh, what about September thirtieth, nineteen ninety nine? This is a, a tricky one. Age of Empires two versus Crash Team Racing. <laughs> no. Age of Empires two takes it. Okay. Day. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What about May eighteenth, twenty ten? One of the probably the best seller for 2010, I'd imagine. Uh, yes, Red Dead Redemption One versus. Is it also Mario Super Mario Galaxy? Galaxy Two? No, good guess though. I think Trauma Center Trauma Team came out that day. No, this is up Kyle's alley. Up my alley. Yeah. So I already I so Red Dead Galaxy. It's not Galaxy One, which nope. was that year. I think. Nope. If you like pine trees and flashlights. Oh, Alan, Alan Wake. Wake. There we go. Oh, yeah. And that's a that's okay. a slam yeah, dunk. Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry, little Alan. Yeah, Wake. I, I remember mm -hmm. having those games like stacked on my uh like, you know, TV stand and like making my way through them one by one. I was like, all right, I'm done with Galaxy, I can move on to Red Dead. You know? yeah. yeah. Uh November tenth, twenty fifteen. Came out first on Xbox. Also they released Tomb Raider? A yes, Rise of the Tomb Raider. And okay. do, you remember, do you remember what it went up against? Fallout 4. Oh. Yeah. I mean... Man, I, I actually... Win? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, honestly. Like, I, I like Tomb Raider a lot. I just... I don't yeah. think either of those games had a huge cultural impact. Yeah. I mean, if it was if it was the first Tomb Raider, I think you could say that that game has influenced a lot of other games following it. Yeah. Like, I feel like Star Wars uh, Fallen Order owes a lot to the that first 2013 Tomb Raider. Mm -hmm. But Which... the second Tomb Raider, not so much. I look, like. I think that game expanded its own personal ideas a lot of like what you can do over just in regular uncharted clone yeah but i don't think that six i it don't think like the xbox exclusivity helped hurt it quite a bit and yeah. i don't think it had the mainstream appeal that the first game did yeah, and I, yeah. I mean the, the main the first one felt like a new like something new like i love the first one i think the yeah. first one it, like, is undervalued even today like i don't think people yeah. really point to it enough for how much it set a new standard for like 3D action games and how to explore and like that sort of middle ground, not quite open world, but sort of open world. But the second one, you're right, Imran, was just sort of like an like a little bit of like not even really an expansion of that as much as just a continuation. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Okay, this one's weird. On in Europe, these overlap. I think it's a fun little note. Uh, Super Mario 3D Land came out the same day as Skyward Sword, and then also oh, in mm -hmm. Europe, 3D World came out the same day as Link Between Worlds. <laughs> It's just like oh, wow. Nintendo loves stacking okay. that for Europe. Um, let's see. Uh, Pokemon Red versus Blue, which had the biggest? No. Um, that was somebody's <laughs> suggestion, which is very great. Going back through this, it reminded me of something that I think we all know in the back of our minds, but it's worth looking at and appreciating every once in a while. The fall of 2007 is the craziest chapter or quarter in video game history. So here's how, just wrap your minds around this fall. 2007, August 21st, 2007, Bioshock's released. September 12th, 2007, Heavenly Sword, which is the weakest by a mile in this batch. September 25th, 2007, a game called Halo 3. October 10th, 2007, 
Portal 1, October 26th, The Witcher 1, November 5th, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, uh, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, I guess I should say, November 13th, Assassin's Creed 1, November 16th, Mass Effect 1, November 19th, Uncharted 1, November 20th, Rock Band 1. <laughs> Yeah, that and I mean, absurd. with the with Portal, you can also throw in Half Life Two Episode Two, right? Yeah, oh, and Team yeah, Fortress Two. Yeah, yeah, and Team Fortress. Well, yeah, Team Fortress Two was that a day and that, day. That was that box? was all Orange Box, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then Mario Galaxy was also that year, that quarter, wasn't it? Or uh, was maybe that, that was earlier. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I missed that one, but yeah, just yeah, an can, insane yeah, murderer's yeah, row. Yeah, absolutely insane. Yeah, and like so, No More Heroes came out that year. Like everything there has. Uh, like, oh, No More Heroes was like early next. It, it was like January of '08. Was it? I th- yeah, it was, it was the same time. But it was. It, it felt like it would be in that same quarter. Yeah, but like almost everything that had succeeded still has games coming out now. Yeah, it God rest heavenly sword. Yeah, the <laughs> Mario Galaxy was and November first. I mean, Hellblade, kind of a right. I mean, just the naming convention. They talked about it being a spiritual successor. Yeah, I guess so. So yeah. crazy. Uh, yeah. So if you think, by doing, the way, it's too yeah. harsh on Heavenly Sword. I played that game twice. I love that game. I, you know, I'd like to stream it at some point, Kyle, because I've never, I've never seen all of Heavenly Sword like that. You but, can do it uh, in uh, like one stream, probably. All right, that sounds great. <laughs> Actually, I think it's like four or five hours. It's not perfect. Short. But yeah, just uh, you know, this Friday has happened before in gaming history, and lo, it will happen again. That's right. right. But the real question is, will Animal Crossing or Doom Eternal be more important? Animal Crossing. Animal Crossing, <laughs> I think, is going to destroy the world I mean, with positivity. It's yeah. not going to change anything. It's also like Doom Eternal is kind of like has the disadvantage of being the sequel versus like as opposed the to impact Animal of Crossing? Doom 2016 versus Animal Crossing may might would have been different, but oh, you uh, know I didn't mention that when we were talking about Doom Eternal earlier, but like that story is weirdly interesting. Like I don't think it's good, but it's interesting. What level of interesting without spoiling anything? Uh to the point where towards the end of the game every time Easy. I picked up a lore thing, I was just like reading every lore thing immediately. Oh, really? Wow. Because it ex- I mean, expands on the lore, or what's it doing to the lore? It it tells the story of what happened to set up Doom 2016, and how I I actually can't get into it. To, okay. like, there's literally embargo stuff, but it is interesting. Huh? Okay. I'll be there. There you go. So fun pro tip for it's gonna wipe the floor. Read, actually, with read the uh, audio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, Jeff, do you think Doom Eternal is gonna have a bigger cultural impact than I, Animal Crossing? I I think. The the influence of both of them is very low, which is why really? I asked. Yeah. Well, Animal Crossing is going to sell 15 gazillion copies. Yeah, sure. But is it that different from other Animal Crossing games? I, I uh, think the influence, is, uh, the influence is, is pretty low, but I think the cultural impact is going to be way higher for yes. Animal Crossing. So please, right I think you'll see a lot, like, order of magnitude more tweets about Animal Crossing for sure. Like, I, even leading up to launch, I feel like that's been sure. the case. I, yeah. I, I mean, based, we were based on about, what very little I've heard from Imran. in the in the industry, industry influence versus you know social media. I think seeing, popularity. I think everybody's seeing everybody playing Animal Crossing. I think it'll give more of a. Boost it's going to solve the coronavirus. Is that I what you're saying? I think it will. It will <laughs> emotionally. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So please. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Kyle. Based on what Imran is saying, like I mean, just even a little bit, like I think games in the future will look more towards Doom mechanically, where Animal Crossing isn't going to change any games in the future. It's just going to be a really great take on, you know, that Animal Crossing formula. That's that a Nintendo great point. We're right, Kyle. I don't think yes. so. I don't think so. I think people are going <laughs> to see just a lighthearted sim and realize that there's so much money in there. That they've been playing those for yeah. years. I think we're having two different arguments. I think Animal Crossing is going to outsell Doom. I think we're going to be talking be about Animal popular, Crossing for a long for time. Sure. But in, in the longer term, I think Doom will uh, influence more game design than Animal Crossing will. I, think I actually think Final Fantasy VII is going to be a bigger deal than both of those. Yeah, well, yeah now right. something we can all agree on. End of conversation. <laughs> uh, do you guys know how this whole thing operates? Discord. Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. So people can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash minmax two ends. We appreciate the support. Uh, you can see our wonderful TV behind us. If you support us to the hundred dollar tier, you can put any image you want on there. Thank you to Jawar Hello for yeah. putting that horrific abomination on there. Uh <laughs> Hey, you know what? If it's a joke making fun of us, we are happy to put it on, uh, whatever you'd like. That's right. Um, but if you support us at any tier, then you can not only leave comments and questions for us to read on air for the MinMax show, but also uh, be involved with The Deepest Dive, which is our game club discussion. We have one coming up uh, next week on Animal Crossing New Horizons and then Final Fantasy VII's remake after that. And if you support us at the $5 tier, you unlock the audio podcast feed where you can listen to all those. And then also we have commentary tracks for Advent Children, uh, this generation or the 
sequel trilogy of the Star Wars films and a lot of other fun bonus stuff in there. So please check that out. But we want to thank uh, our supporter, um, I Am 8-Bit. Every week they ship out a prize uh, for our favorite question of the week. And they want us to let people know that uh, they have the Ori in the Blind Forest and also the Ori and the Will of the Wisps soundtrack on vinyl uh, on their store. So if you go to I Am 8-Bit store and use the promo code MINMAX, you get 10% off that. Uh, let's see, have you guys been playing that? How is the soundtrack to Ori and the Will of the Wisps? Fantastic. Good, yeah. Incredible. Okay, great. Uh, I Am 8-Bit says, Few tales are as emotionally resonant as the story of Ori, so it's with great glee that we welcome Moon Studios' much anticipated, much anticipated continuation, Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Composer Gareth Coker evolves Ori's oral journey with both majesty and nuance, paying great care to the vulnerability and wonder of where we left last them in the chapter. Emboldened by beautiful album art by Aaron Vest, this is a strong, elegant, and absolutely all-encompassing soundtrack that will act as your own personal guardian spirit. Mm -hmm. So check that out, and uh, thanks to I Am 8-Bit for their support. And now let's figure out the I Am 8-Bit question of the week. So a lot of people submitted some wonderful questions uh, on our Patreon page. You can submit a question, and then look at this. The Banner Saga 3 soundtrack on vinyl. How sweet is this? So we're going to choose our absolute favorite question. Imran, you remember how this works, right? Yep. Great. And I'm 8-Bit is going to ship out something real nice. So good luck to everybody that wrote in. Okay. First question comes from James Smith. Uh, he says, hey, Babyface Hanson is computer-loving cohorts. Love it. Given Jason Schreier's new article about Crunch at Naughty Dog and the studio culture, do you think we'll be seeing a Raising Kratos-style documentary about the development of Last of Us Part Two, or to be too sore of a subject for Sony, Naughty Dog, and the developers? P.S. I think it's really great that Hanson is giving the local youth a shot at hosting Midmax content. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. One of these days, we will all go out for drinks once you're 21. <laughs> <laughs> that's really terrifying. I just want to clarify, I only love computers as a friend. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, I teach their own. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if you saw this. Yes, but Kotaku had a big article from Jason Trier talking about crunch at Naughty Dog, which I believe, you know, if you pay attention to the industry, it seems like that is the number one big AAA studio for, hey, crunch is a nightmare here. People are busting their ass. Mm -hmm. And the thesis or like the conclusion or I guess the main topic with the Kotaku article was about the fact that it's just they're burning through developers at a crazy rate that they have a surprising amount of junior staff with last of us part two especially on the design team um just because like the developers can't handle it emotionally and physically anymore and there's like i'm out and you know shire's point is like hey that's a terrible trend for the industry is to lose our senior staff uh, yeah. because of this um what did you all think of that imran what did you think of that article i uh, it's not i mean there's been a lot of whispers about naughty dog specifically for many years at this point yeah so it wasn't really shocking, but I I think like it does it comes at a bad time for Sony who wants to market that game. And I think uh I don't think PR is really keeping too much of an eye on what that article's fallout was. Because Druckmann came out almost immediately afterwards and started touting the animation in the game. So it's like, yeah, this is this is a bad time to do that. I think he was trying to make the best of it. Um I think he Felt attacked, but here's why. So the the article goes live, and Jonathan Cooper, who has been an animator in Assassin's Creed, um, and also he was at Naughty Dog for quite a while, he tweeted the Kotaku article about the brutal development over there and said, so proud to be a part of this studio, but a part, no space in there, with little, little play on words. Um, then I think he got so much attention for that tweet that he's like, okay, let's really expand on this. So... Uh, he started expanding on it and saying, hey, when I left Night Dog late last year, they threatened to withhold my final paycheck until I signed additional paperwork stating that I wouldn't share their production practices. They finally relented when I assured them that that was most likely illegal. The <laughs> reason I left is because I only want to work with the best. That is no longer Naughty Dog. The reputation for crunch within LA is so bad that it was near impossible to hire seasoned game animators to close out the project. As such, we loaded up on film animators. There are Naughty Dog stories worse than this. Uh, he told a bunch of stories about this. It's a whole thread on, on Twitter you can find. Um, Jonathan Cooper is his name. But he says, uh, there are Naughty Dog stories worse than the ones I wrote, but like everything on my Twitter, I'm focusing on animation. For The Last of Us 2 fans, the game should turn out great with industry-leading animation. I would just not recommend anyone work at Naughty Dog until they prioritize talent retention. Ultimately, Naughty Dog's linear games have a formula and they focus test the crap out of it. While talented, their success is due in large part to Sony's deep pockets funding delays rather than skill alone. A more senior team would have shipped The Last of Us Part Two a year ago. 
which is pretty brutal to see somebody, Mm -hmm. you know, being so honest, but also willing to burn some bridges within the industry. And it was Mm -hmm. nice to see other developers kind of retweet that and say like, yeah, we have to talk about this stuff. Obviously, yeah. I, I think to okay. me, one of like the most striking thing about the report is that, you know, we, we've we've heard about several other studios kind of doing this and even, you know, obviously Naughty Dog specifically. Uh, but I think that report specifically, like really crystallizes why, why you should care. I think even if you're like the kind of person who's like, oh, you know, you're, if you're getting burnt out, then like you're just weak or whatever. Like, it doesn't matter. Like I as a consumer, like this doesn't affect me. Um, I think because of the the focus on. Uh, the the talent burnout and things like that. I think th- that was like a thing where if Naughty, if The Last of Us Part Two ends up being not as good as the first game, you can kind of cl- very clearly point to why. Uh, I mean, obviously there are a number of reasons why that might be, but the the idea that a lot of the people who didn't work on the who worked on the first one aren't working on this one at like right. pretty in pretty crucial roles, yeah. like the design team specifically. Well, the, I think the director of the it, game, yeah, he left. He burned yeah, out after Uncharted Four. Like, that that is a thing that you even if you're the kind of person who like looks at that kind of stuff normally and doesn't care like that is a thing that you should be concerned about if you're a big fan of like Naughty Dog in general is the idea that their war culture is so bad that the games could at some point be worse right like and I think that that's I think why he made that statement about Sony's deep pockets is that like they have so much money that they can just buy you know like kind of brute force quality in, in in to some degree of like that game the fidelity of the graphics and like the audio design and all of like the technical aspects i think they're gonna be like at higher as high as they could be but be there expensive. might be yeah yeah and so like there might be subtler ways that that game is not uh as as fulfilling as the first one that you might not notice at first but will lead, kind of lead maybe you know obviously we haven't none of us have played the game could lead to like uh, you know, I can't pinpoint why, but I don't know that this one hit me as hard. And like, this is kind of that, th- this is what maybe could have led to that. But yes, if, but if they're just funding it and stretching out the development and extending crunch for these developers to try and make up for that difference in talent, you know, it's it's a mess. But yeah, so then you're getting to what Imran was talking about. Neil Druckmann tweeted, even after years of working on it, I'm still blown away by the animation in part two. We have one of, if not that if not the best animation team in the industry, both in raw animation skill and technical knowledge. Can't wait for you to experience their incredible work. So I'm sure, I mean, just reading between the lines here, it feels like Neil Druckmann was, you know, wanting to defend his team. The fact that it's like, well, it's kind of junior animation teams. It's all they can really afford because they're burning out on all the higher end folks. I'm sure he wanted to make sure that, you know, that animators that have been crunching their asses off for a while now don't feel insulted by that. Um, But it is a weird look and it looks a little bit like circling the wagons at Naughty Dog, but they're a really proud studio and they should be, but it is about time that we look at what they're doing to human beings over there. Right. Mm-hmm. So brutal time. It, yeah. And, and to the point that the other question that Smith was asking was, uh, would they release a documentary? I could totally see them releasing that documentary that does just does, doesn't really address that stuff as much yeah. as a very sanitized version. Yeah. yeah. I think it, raising Kratos is, I think great and does, you know, do a good job of showing some realities of that project. But I mean, they touch on the documentary, but yeah, God of War also just a hell for people working on it. Um, But I think a lot of that documentary heritage comes from like the God of War series and Corey Barlog wanting that documentary specifically. Um, So I don't think that Naughty Dog's history of documentaries is as honest or revealing as the Raising Kratos documentary, even though Grounded, I think is very good, but it's not, it's not as brutal of a look at game development. I mean, the fact that they were potentially trying to not pay someone because of the potential of their sort of uh, system of designing games, you would maybe talk about that on the internet. Like, that seems like they're pretty closed off, too. Yeah, right. For sure. Yeah, and that they're to some degree aware of what is going on in their studio, but either can don't have the means or don't want to uh, address, like, some of those crucial things that are kind of holding the studio back to some degree. Right. And uh, there's a, speaking of just, you know, PR snafus or honesty, whoever you want to see it. Um, there was a weird moment too, where Jonathan Cooper on Twitter, uh, he tweeted out and said, Hey, while endemic and AAA naughty dog crunch is legendary. Don't take it from me. Here is the studio director of gorilla calling me out for crunch ostensibly due to the lack of producers. So he's retweeting an old response to an old tweet he had when he worked at naughty dog from Jan Barter bridges, who's from, uh, Gorilla, he came up with the whole concept for Horizon Zero Dawn, but when talking about the lack of producers at uh, Naughty Dog, uh, JB here, which is how he goes, what he goes by, he says, careful, or we might mention crunch. 
smiley face. So it's like that weird thing of like when Sony developers are like, eh, hey, crunch, ha ha ha, like back and forth, even publicly on Twitter. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. So, hey, good times. Um, Let's see. Kevin <laughs> Robinson says, hey, all. Oh, actually, we talked about that. The Amazon uh, Final Fantasy VII delay. Final Fantasy VII is not delayed, but the physical versions might be tricky to get. Okay, Greg Fleming Queso, Greg Fleming says, hey, howdy, hey, Hanson and the CLCs and the former informer Imran Khan. Howdy, uh, hey. Imran, come on. Give us that juicy gossip on kind of funny. Be honest. <laughs> is Greg Miller silently farting all the time? Tell us something. <laughs> tell us something that the general public doesn't know about kind of funny. What something the general public would not know about kind of funny? Yeah. It's it's actually one of the most fun work experiences to have of like just going back there and just going like there's a studio obviously, but the whole studio is scheduled to like an apartment. And going into that like apartment office and just hanging out for a little bit, I show up before our actual call times would be, our recording times. It's just nice to just hang out and grab something to eat from the fridge or talk to people there because everyone there is always having fun. Yeah. Like, I mean, honestly, Game Informer was like that too for like the one day I was there. The one day? That's just uh, and you worked remotely, yeah. Yes. But like it, everyone there really enjoys their job and everyone's, they're all very professional. They all treat it like a job, but it's after the cameras are off and like you just, people think, what are they like that? Out, off the camera as well like it's just yes like i'm talking to the producer about like what their day was like and how how they're getting things along these days like that's the kind of it's more of a friendship among, among people than people would actually think and i think that's really important just for having that energy and tone uh that's a nice thing about having that studio you know yeah the cold basement could use a little more of that. Could use more I, of that yeah. hangout zone. I was, <laughs> was going to ask Imran, do, up. do they have a bench press and skeleton, though, behind the scenes? Just what we have outside the studio. It's really a nightmare. Don't come here, Imran. It's hell. They want, at some point, some like lifetime supply of LaCroix. So they're just like mm. pallets of LaCroix sitting outside. Are you kidding that me? Is, what is going on? See, this is... Is this Pepsi, right? Pepsi makes bubbly? Yeah, I guess so. And they can't get their shit together? Come on! <laughs> Prioritize what's important yeah. in the world at right now. LaCroix, at least LaCroix understands what's going on with these, <laughs> how hot these podcasts are. <laughs> I think I tried reaching out to LaCroix and no answer, but hey, you <laughs> know, we, we love You're it. supposed to reach out to Bubbly, Hanson. I, the... <sighs> I don't know what's going on. The point is, Jacques Nell. Oh, anyways, sorry, Imran. Um, what, are you, what are you doing over there that you're most proud of? What would you want people to check out from your work at Kind of Funny? Uh, we've started a thing called First Impressions, which is essentially just giant bomb quick looks or like the kind of video previews you do at Game Informer. Yeah. I think I really enjoy doing those like a lot, like just playing a game and explaining it and like reaching back to other examples of games like that. It's maybe it's just because I've watched so many giant bomb quick looks in my ears. Like, but I think I, I'm both very good at that and I enjoy doing it so much. Yeah. Oh, right on. That's fun. Um, Jacques Nell says, hello, man, Max, whose job is it to write achievements for games? It's designers. Well, I know Rod Ferguson wrote them for Gears like two, right? Yeah. Okay, so the answer is Rod Ferguson. Yeah, well, they're also like he writes all of them. Yeah, like studios will have meetings where like, well, what do we have for this achievement or whatever. Sometimes they will get like they will leave achievements till the very last second and just kind of outsource it to friends and family. Like, hey, what do you think would be funny for this thing? Or yeah. stuff like that. A little bit. Anson, everybody. what's your favorite achievement? Uh, what is an achievement? Um, <laughs> let's see. Real. No, we were just arguing one. about this uh, when we were streaming Warzone. I feel like. Dental like life. Checklist. Dental oh life yeah, I had like one it. where like if you lose ten matches online, you get a zero point achievement that just says you lost ten matches. Yeah, I <laughs> so have just that one. Fun of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> neat. Uh, I remember uh, on the South Park Stick of Truth cover story trip, we were. Uh, at the studio and we had a call with Matt and Trey, which was near the highlight of my life, getting to interview Matt and Trey along with Brian Vore. And, and it probably halfway through the interview at some point there, Brian Vore asked Matt and Trey like, hey, have you guys thought about writing the achievements? Are you going to put a lot of jokes in the achievements for this game? And Matt and Trey were like, oh yeah, achieve. It's like, it's fun to hear them be like, oh yeah, that's a thing oh, we yeah. gotta do at some point. Huh? Oh Christ. And then the game was delayed for years. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, Charles Davis asked. No, I, I, I oh, had a quick thing please. for achievements where I th I think uh, the PS4 version of Undertale has some really, really good ones. 
uh, because they're just like, he starts off and he gives you an achievement like that are, uh, that's really easy. It's like get an item and he titles it. Don't worry. I have a lot of ideas for trophies and then you get two <laughs> items and it's like, like getting items, get three items or getting more items. <laughs> and then at four items, it said, help me. I'm out of ideas. <laughs> and that's just a really good joke that, that you only get in the PS4 version. Oh, that's I, awesome. I, I, yeah, I, well, Vita as well, I think. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. I forgot about the Vita as people are wanted. There's also like, I, I forgot about those. Those are really good. Portal 2 had one, I think it was like chapter 9, where like, Glado says, this is the part where I kill you. The chapter nine, or chapter title comes up saying, the part where she kills you. Then an achievement pops up, the part where she kills you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, no, this is, this is something that will not work if you don't have like complete control over when achievements pop up. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I always think back to terribly timed achievements. I think back to Enslaved. Spoiler for Enslaved, Odyssey to the West, everybody, your journey to the West, whatever. Um, there's some point where you're, Buddy, is it Pig or Pigsy? <laughs> he dies, and I think he dies in a fire, and then the achievement pops up, and it's like, I smell bacon, or something. I'm like, what? It's, like, it's an emotional moment, and they like make this horrible joke about this character yeah. that you're supposed to care achievement about. Achievement jokes. Good. Uh, yeah, you know Tamim. He's such a kidder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Charles Davis says, do you believe in luck slash karma? Why? I don't. <laughs> yeah. But I think like societal karma, like if somebody like is that much of a jerk, usually people will distance themselves or like kind of go out right to screw somebody. But I don't think there's a guiding force behind it. Yeah, I don't think that. Yeah, I don't think there's a guiding force by it, but it does make me feel better if I just tell if something, you know, if someone does something evil or bad, I'm like, well, they'll get what's coming to them at some point. Right. (laughs) Like it'll turn around on them. And like it just gives me some solace. But like I don't. I don't actually believe that any of that will happen. It's, it's not the co- it's not the cosmic sense, but the if you're going around doing bad things to people, it's their the way that they interact with you is probably going to have an effect on you. Where, versus if you're doing nice things for people, right? People will probably like you more, and they would be there for you in those kind of times and stuff like that. Yeah, right? and on the luck front, I know that's a hot debate, but no, I don't really. I don't know. I believe in the kind of. Uh, the stupid thing of like making your own luck. I do believe that with luck, I think it's tied into the fact that I think like success, success overall snowballs, you know, of like you start doing things, they start clicking together and then that leads to more connections, more connections, more connections. And that can really work that way. So if you want to call that luck, you still got to. That's kind of the opposite of luck, I think. I guess. That's putting the work in and. I guess so. Yeah. Things. But it feels like, oh, it's so lucky. All these mm-hmm. things are lining up. You know, I think like Dan Rakert's always a good example. We talked about it actually in our one-on-one interview. Well, that dude's just plain it. lucky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think he's he still puts in a lot of effort to get the ball rolling in a direction. And now his life is just one big downhill roll of a snowball. Yeah. I mean, when those those situations that are out of your hand, like if you have a job interview or something where it's yeah. like you can do your best, like in those situations, I will be like, well, I'm going to wear these socks today because it gives me like five percent more confidence but it's like i don't actually believe it's a factor but it's just like it's a weird i have a weird relationship with it where like i do in some cases think well maybe this will bring me a little luck but like i don't actually believe in luck as like a like a like a religious or spiritual thing right does anybody believe in luck as a religious thing (laughs) right in if you believe in luck as a religious thing uh tim laro says hey i've been playing a lot of persona 5 lately which as far as i can tell will never end correct uh, mm-hmm. However, one detail that makes it feel less daunting is that the loading screen always reminds the player to, quote, take your time. This reminder literally tells the best way to approach this game. Do you think more developers should be explicit with the player about how to enjoy the game? I'm imagining that the witness should say, grab a pen and paper, or Guitar Hero should say, stand up, you bum. And until Don should say, we can start when you have a friend on the couch with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think people should be more blunt. Developers should be more blunt with those loading screen tips. I'm with you. I mean, being in sort of like a journalist and like talking to game developers who have told us things about games, like this was my idea for this, this was my intention, like that does make me appreciate things more. So I don't think they should be scared to like like do that. Like say, you know, you might like it more if you think about it this way. Yeah. yeah. To, to bring up Doom Eternal again, they have a thing in that game where every boss fight right before like if it's even a little complicated if it's more than just like point and shoot at the thing yeah. they will explain to you what it like what the gimmick is so you don't have to spend time or lives or health figuring it out so it's so like okay well this guy's when it turns green he's gonna attack so that's the time you counterattack. Hmm. but like then it just becomes an issue of execution and i think it actually works really well it breaks the fourth wall and do- it doesn't treat you like an idiot it tells you we don't want you to spend time just trying to die to figure this out 
Right. Yeah, that's helpful. That's nice. Mm -hmm. um, Grizzled Gaming wrote in with a very sweet plug talking about, um, well, here we go. So he says, hey, since more and more people are staying at home now, I thought it'd be a good idea to remind everybody about the amazing MinMax online community you've built. Uh, there's a MinMax PlayStation community, MinMax Xbox Club, and a MinMax Steam community, all filled with great people to play games. Just search MinMax 2 ends, of course, on any platform. If you see that sweet new logo, you found it. Also, I highly <laughs> encourage everyone to check out the Community Game Night channel in Discord. These are organized events with dates and games voted on by the community, and they're a blast. In the past, we've played Halo, Smash Brothers, Modern Warfare, Jackbox Party Pack, so jump in. Lastly, I'd like to give a shout-out to Adam Walker, Texas Ranger. In addition to helping organize the official community game nights, he's almost daily doing impromptu game nights with the community. He may not really be from Texas, but he's still doing it big in the community. Good That's job. awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah Adam, Adam Walker's yeah. the best, man. Yeah. He's always around. Yeah, and that Discord is a really great uh, thing to experience in this time. Seems yeah, like that that is, again, an, a really nice resource. If you are looking to play games, but you hate going into online games with random people who are going to be swearing at you. And yeah. I've had a couple people pop up in, in my war zone when I, don't, when I forget to mute everyone immediately as uh -huh. soon as I get in there. And it's, it's always just that constant reinforcement of like, oh, yeah, I don't want to be hearing people like this. <laughs> but you can actually find your own group on the Discord. So. There we go. Uh, Michael yep. Archer says, hey, now that everyone's stuck at home, what games are you going to be tackling in your backlog? I'm personally finally, finally able to sink my teeth into Dragon Quest XI after having almost zero time to play any kind of media RPG or games for that matter. What's everybody tackling? Dragon Quest is on that list for me. I think I'm 60 hours in that game and I've not hit the halfway point yet. You haven't hit... So, wait, what? Have you seen credits? No. Oh my god, I beat that in 55 hours, and I felt like that was a lifetime. I loved it, but like I hit credits at least at 55 hours. I th Well, because the Switch version has like those extra scenes and stuff like that, and also I, just, oh. I take a long time to do a lot of stuff in that game. Yeah. So like, I'm still taking, it's still taking forever. I'm still enjoying the game quite a bit. It's just, man, it does last a really long time. Yeah, for sure. Take your time, man. Take your time. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like I haven't really fully gotten the quarantine zone yet but i was very proud of myself for finishing kakarot over the weekend oh nice uh, i had to delay playing warzone with other people but i really i oh, love that game what did you think of the boof the kid boof fight especially was the weirdest thing to me why is that what do you mean no, no spoilers so, well I, I how do i explain this That's because jeff was watching it, well right? here's one thing that was weird to me is it like towards the end there's a lot of like this is it. This is it, Goku. And it's like, okay, I know there's so many layers to this fight that I don't know if this is actually it. I should use up all my sensu beans because, hey, turns out Boo kills everybody on Earth. And so I can't make, I can't go collect more sensu beans and like yeah. I'm out of money. But I definitely had that weird moment of like, you know, not to spoil things, Goku uses a spirit bomb at some point against Kid so, Boo. Yes. And so like, that is yes, he's building up the spirit bomb. And then he's like, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. And I'm like, okay, so. Am I supposed to actually kill him? Because I'm low on sensu beans, so maybe I'll try using a spirit bomb attack. So I used a spirit bomb attack in the battle and threw a little spirit bomb at him, and then like <laughs> it didn't trigger anything. So like, oh, I thought that was supposed to be it. I thought you're supposed to manually trigger it, but it turns out no. I just shot a little one while the big one is still hovering above me. It's very nonsensical. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a weird thing of like in the show, Goku throws a spirit bomb, and like that's like the big dramatic thing for that scene, that fight. Yeah. And then in the game, it's like, I'm going to charge the spirit bomb. Oh, wait, let's take a break to fight for real for a little bit. And then I'm going right. to go back to the spirit bomb after that. I'm like, that's weird. I, I understand you needed a boss fight there, but strange. Yeah. And it's funny to see, like, I think the production of that game, once you get used to what that game is, which I th still think is so many notches above the average Dragon Ball game outside of fighters. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's funny to see like where they do take the shortcuts. Cause I think a lot of those big moments, like I think like the end of cell and stuff, I think it's incredibly well done. I think the cinematography is, is stunning. I think it looks great, but then there are those moments where they do take shortcuts, like at a certain point, I guess, I don't know without spoiling it again, but Goku and Vegeta go inside of Boo. And the fact that they just like, don't show any of that. <laughs> Cause they don't want to make that environment worry about those art assets. Cause it's a whole freaky thing. So they yeah. just like show the outside of Boo, like, Oh, ah, oh, transforming and stuff. It's, it's funny. The shortcuts they do take along the way, but that's enough about Dragon Ball. What are you guys tackling from your backlog? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I, it's not my backlog. I'm sort of giving you guys an assignment, but you know, it would be really great to play right now. What's that? Is death stranding. <laughs> you think so? Just about reconnecting mm. the world. 
Yeah, and it's also about people who don't want to go outside and interact with other people. <laughs> like, you literally walk up to people and they call you from inside their homes, and that's how you talk to them. Yeah, except for that one lady in one of the most awkward scenes of that game. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, <laughs> we have a max spoilers uh, all about Death Stranding. You want to check that out? Yeah, but um, um I mean, I I'm, just, I'm I don't really have a lot of backlog lock backlog stuff I'm tackling. Like, I love I'm loving Ori. Ori is great, and I'm really enjoying that. And um. Um, I'm still playing uh, two Picross games back to back. I got uh, 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 God, what? Sorry, what's Murder the No Man. Man's No uh, No More Heroes game I bought, and I'm already Travis playing. Travis Strikes again. again. Travis Strikes Again was on sale, so I picked up that. Mm -hmm. And then Warzone, I'm still playing uh, yeah. more than I expected to. So that's kind of like I, I'm not really going into my backlog so much. It's just I have a lot to play right in front of me, which is nice, which is good. For sure. Yeah, I I have been surprisingly busy during the during this time, so it hasn't felt like oh now I have all this. Free uh, play my backlog, but I've been I, I, I've also been playing Ori, uh, um, and I've also been playing some Dota because they just had a new patch. Because uh, uh, I mean, now uh, Snapfire, who I mentioned earlier on this show, is having a big writing lizard that she has. Uh, now has a new ability where she can eat another member of her team and then spit them back out, and that stuns everyone in the area and does a lot of damage. So. Uh, basically, I'm saying it's basically like a new game now. So mm, okay. <laughs> that my backlog right. is playing more Dota. Yeah. So when you said writing lizard, I heard writing lizard. No, 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 writing, writing. She, she rides like, on top of it like it's a horse. I'm, I'm a writing lizard would actually be a very a nice. writing. Yeah, yeah. They should do that. No, we'll next, next character. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Michael Archer uh, also adds, "Hey, what are the odds of Jeff finishing Red Dead Two? Dang it, we almost got through that whole conversation. <laughs> I, I actually might do that myself. Like, I oh, really? Game that much at first, but maybe now's the time to give it a shot. Absolutely, it's the it's time. Really good. It Just turns out. force yourself to get in that groove. I know it's a tough groove to really settle into, but once you're in it, you're going to love it. I know. I do. I do really want to go back to it. I've been playing Warzone, and I really like it. And I'm still kind of in that love affair." period with it that yeah. i want to keep on going on it but i i should i should just go play red dead uh we Dude, should play wait. more warzone we, sh we also, absolutely should dan Reichert is bugging me on a daily basis to play warzone i haven't had time yet so you should play with him <laughs> yeah i kind of feel like playing with dan would be like you playing with the other dan the other day oh i see where he would just be a total pain in the ass <laughs> the entire time no, yeah. playing with uh, dan Reichert means that you'll just win jeff um yeah, his luck set. Right. Oh, that's lucky. right. Well, that is true. He is, is true. he is a very lucky guy. And I, but I did also see that they just added solo mode to it. Yeah, you can actually queue up just solo people. Yep. now. Super so. exciting. I'm excited yep. for duos. But yeah, solo is great. Uh, Parv Parkia says hello, Max Min Company. Since people are stuck at home because of the coronavirus, do you have any suggestions for virtual tabletop slash board games that friends can play without being at the same place? Easy to learn, free games are a bonus. Oh, that's a good question. When I when I heard that question earlier, spoiler, we do we do hear some of the questions early. It was just digital tabletop oh, games. Oh, well that that works. Uh but there I would say that there there is a company that makes the app versions for Android and iOS that's called Digi Diced, D I G I D I C E D, and they they make them for a wide variety of publishers but they are really kind of the best ones out there right now and they do handle uh online play better than other apps at this point do some you probably won't be able to find a lot of public matches because just a lot of people don't play them that way yeah. but if you have friends that have those those um those games you can you can kind of trade friend codes or whatever yeah. with that or I, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of leo vader a tabletop simulator yeah. on steam is pretty cheap mm -hmm. pretty cheap and they have created every tabletop yeah. game within that yeah with those ones you can't it it doesn't actually follow the rules you'll have to know the rules yourself to play through them but right but if you already know the games then that's not a problem i've heard that the steam version of scythe is really good i haven't checked that one out yet but that is kind of that is and terraforming mars i think is out now i believe but those are kind of two of the bigger euro games that that they can, you can tell they put a lot of work into making those very big polished yeah. versions of it so Sweet. check those out uh also Jeff, yeah. a, i have oh. a quick question as our uh game pass correspondent and tabletop games correspondent have you touched ticket to ride on 
on uh, Xbox at all. I it's haven't. In, it's in Game Pass, which yeah. I was surprised about last night. Yeah, I've I've played again the app version of that. It's a it's a very nice version. I'm assuming it's just a port of that. It's on Switch as well, I think, at this point, and mm. I'm sure I'm sure that will be a great experience too. Yeah. Um, also, we've talked a little bit about what we can do because I think a lot of people are going to be missing their regular board game nights. People are mm. not going to want to go hang out with friends too much. So, you know, we have tabletop streams which are now, which are now going to be public uh, with the relaunch. We changed some things. Yep. And so we've talked about, like, how do we play a board game with the community instead of just packing people around this table? And yeah. we have some loose ideas, but nothing locked down yet. But, you know, we'll, we'll... We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out, a way for the community to actually play along with us. Most likely scenario is we play more concept and mm -hmm. then only let people in the chat guess. I think that'd be yeah. really fun. That'd be fun. Uh, okay, we got Phil S. He says, hey, cohort. Hello. Uh, as working from home is becoming more common, yes, um, how do you feel about game companies being centralized in major, often expensive cities? What do you see as the benefit of putting a studio in San Francisco? And as a Minnesota-based channel, how has that distance impacted you? Um, we're invited to fewer events, but that's also probably because we're a small channel at this point. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Well, I mean, that was that was kind of true with Game Informer 2. I guess I guess yeah. we were invited to That was to why them. I got a job in the first place. Yeah. Yes, that, yeah. is, that is true. We were invited to them, but we just wouldn't send people out as much. Right, yeah. right. But yeah, I don't, I mean, this is an old thing, but on the Portal 2 cover story trip, which I wasn't on, but uh, legend is told from folks that were on that, that Eric Wolpot, Valve, <laughs> that he was screaming at Gabe in a joking way, but like, we need to move Valve to Duluth, Minnesota, because Eric Wolpot is from Duluth, Minnesota. He's like, we would live as kings. We would literally be financial gods. Like, we need to move all of Valve over there. I love that idea. Someday yeah. I hope Valve does move to Duluth, Minnesota. Yeah. Or even yeah. if it's not Duluth, just come to Minnesota. It's a super nice state. Yeah. It's, it's livable. We have okay. plenty of space. Yeah. The last time I was in Minnesota was only for an airline thing or like an airport transfer. It was negative 10 degrees. Negative yeah, 12 degrees. Really Look, beautiful. it's winters. It kills off the viruses probably. Yes, <laughs> <What> exactly. <you're laughs> and once you're inside, it's at least 60. Unless you're in the MinMax studio. And we're, we're coming up on 27 degrees in here. Yeah. So <laughs> it's working My out. My tea doesn't freeze anymore. Yes. So, But Imran, why are so many studios still in San Francisco? What the hell is going on out there? It's stupid, I mean, right? mo momentum is a lot of it. It's like EA is here, so a lot of EA studios are here. But at the same time, like... It's you if you live here, if this is where you attract talent because people are already yeah. here, it's the same thing behind a lot of like game journalism is here as well. And that's also because game studios are here. So it's it's a cyclical, a cyclical problem, but not people don't really see it as a problem as long as they can make do. Mm -hmm. I don't know right now that it makes a whole lot of sense to be a studio in San Francisco, but for, for the large part, I think uh momentum is the main thing it's it's always yeah. been that way so yeah the talent is there well that's be a, here yeah that's a good sign of just how i think society is going to be remixed for a while moving forward as so many people are learning oh i can do my job remotely or we can develop these games remotely like a moon studios or something like what does that mean maybe people will be less less compelled to stick in larger cities like yeah that. and if if big studios figure out an infrastructure since they have to now at this point yeah then yeah that that would be much easier there are a lot of companies that have already been figuring out oh we can have our companies or we can have our employees work from home and that's cheaper for us and if if a lot of companies are forced to figure that out now the logistics of it then i could totally see them opening that up that 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 opens up the talent pool even much larger at that point because then your employees can be anywhere yeah for sure uh, Neil Brown writes in with a great question here. Neil Brown says, Salutations, fellow gamers. Salutations. Um, what's the most satisfying attack or ability to land in any game? Is I it, have an immediate answer for this I, one. Okay, he's, he's, there's more here. He has examples. Oh. Uh, hitting the final blow on a Colossus, sticking a sticky grenade on someone, nailing a sick-ass 360 no-scope headshot, or maybe getting a gigantic harvest in Stardew Valley? Would love to hear your thoughts. All right, Imran, what do you got, man? The charge R2 from God of War 2018. The one where, like, if you hold the axe out and it, like, goes into the whatever the zombie thing, it, like, slices Draugr. into him a little bit. Okay. And, like, that is... I don't know why that was so satisfying to pull off, but every single time it was, I was like, okay, that... They pulled this off perfectly. Yeah, I feel like, overall, an underappreciated aspect of the axe in God of War is, like, how heavily it uh, vibrates. 
and how it yeah. vibrates as it's rotating, like whoa, 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 as it's going out. Like the fact that they're keeping you connected to the axe the entire time, like, oh, it just feels so incredible. That's a very good suggestion. Uh, yes. Uh, older, old school one, more old school at least, the 3D Ninja Gaiden game, you had a a jump attack where you, if you timed it right and you jumped, you would shoot at an enemy and if, if you timed it perfectly, their head would pop off and exp- and like shoot up in the air in a geyser of blood and stuff. Out. But it, it was... It was difficult to pull off, but every time that you that that just made it more satisfying when you did pull it off. Yeah, yeah. I think of like a competitive angle, um, and I've been playing Link in Smash Brothers since the original Smash Brothers. That A down or C down, however you want to do it, the like Zelda two move of having the sword below you and going for the mm-hmm. big drop, finishing off somebody in Smash Brothers with that mm-hmm. move. I think that's peak gaming. I don't think it gets any better than that. <laughs> I mean, I like any time. I mean, it's, it's not even game specific, but like a good counter. Mm. Like, you know, like fall in mm. order, just blocking at the right moment to like instantly kill somebody. It's like it, it's incredibly satisfying when you pull it off in From Games and Sekiro and stuff like that. Yeah, like I the step maker is, is really good. Uh, the, the one where you step on their blade, basically, and yes. then oh, yeah, them. Yeah, that yeah really like good. that. Any time, like it's it's funny because like I don't even lean into it too much because it's always hard to pull off and dangerous. But when you pull off like a good counter in a 3D action game, it's really satisfying. Yeah. Neo has a lot of like it's part of the main conceit of Neo 2's battle system is just beast counters basically, and they all feel really good. They feel awful when you don't do them right, but when they actually succeed, it feels amazing. Is yeah, that why amazing. you like the Batman games so much, Kyle? Because it's just counter, counter, counter. I mean, maybe it's it's why I like uh, the only fighting game that I've ever like really, really gotten into is Dead or Alive 4. And because that game has like a really co- like dense counter system no, about that, like getting out of that was the high kicks, like Kyle. <laughs> oh, mm, so, oh, that's why I like high. that. One. Yeah. Uh, like an anti-air throw in a fighting game, like watching like when you know someone's about to jump and you basically do the maneuver that would basically jumps you in the air as well. And so when you counter them and the, like uh, Hugo's backbreakers are a good one where he jumps into the air. And if you happen to be also in the air, he'll like bring you back down and then break your back and then throw you aside. Yeah. So stuff like that. I'm a big fan of. Yeah, oh. Ladiva has a good number of good ones in Grand Blue. Yeah, for Ooh, sure. Nice. I just thought of another one. It's a little bit different, but uh, in Age of Mythology, one of my favorite games of all time, uh, one of like the God powers you get with um, Isis, which is the God that I play in that game is uh, Meteor. And like if it's the fourth power and if you just click on any area in the map, once you get that, it is just a rain of meteors just annihilating their town. And if they have like a full army there and they don't get out of the way in time, then it's literally just like elephants and horses and soldiers just flying as meteors just collapsing. It's the so, best. So you love decimating armies as ISIS in video games. Is that it? Hey, moving on. Uh, Jacob Shoemaker <laughs> also has a question. <laughs> that over that actually reminds me of the, the nuke in StarCraft. Similar yes, thing where yes. it takes forever to set up when you like watch it come down and everything and like the, basically the entire screen just blows up. I think is a really good feeling too. Hundred percent, it is so good. Uh, Jacob Shoemaker says, "Hey, as technology has moved forward, file sizes have become larger. Using image files as an example, higher resolution image files take up more spaces than their predecessors. Um, my question is, do you think at a certain point will file sizes stop growing? On an infinite timeline, is there a future where we see a one million? gig photo file or larger or will we eventually get all the information we possibly can from an image file in a finite amount of data isn't this a fun one yeah that is fun <laughs> and and i would think that for image files it has to end at some point right why would it? like there's there's just a point where the resolution doesn't matter anymore if you're looking at a picture of your mom like you do all the time hansen <laughs> it's just a certain level of detail after a certain level it's like well this doesn't matter anymore right yeah, if but, i'm looking at a picture technology of... will always insist that they can improve it and you know yeah it'll yeah. be bigger and yeah. bigger and bigger wasn't there like a bajillion pixels you know? wasn't there like some camera recently that can save photos at like multiple points of focus where it's like here's the foreground yeah. and then here's yeah. the background so at some point like that's just where we go is like photo files that have more utility versus just like more pure resolution. Mm. Well, I think eventually like the, Blade, the Blade Runner photos where you can like dive into them as 3D images. Well, 100%. That's around. what I want, guys. I want the future photos to just be like the 3D spheres, kind of like the flink, and then it's just like takes the entire room and then you can like rotate around and move around and, and stuff. It, and yeah. it, it kind of adds like a virtual audience in the back that will kind of shift <laughs> in a realistic way. 
<laughs> yes, all your it's pictures. Be perfect. Yeah. Although, do you think we're going to get to that day of just the snap your finger entire room photographed? Because I was thinking, like, that'd be awesome yeah. and great, but I think of, uh, there's going to be some weirdo upskirt stuff going on there immediately. Well, I mean, right? we already have 3D cameras to take, like, full 360-degree yeah. photos, so. I guess yeah, we'll so, but soon. I'm talking about, like, you know, it's like, okay, being re re like a model of room. Yeah, so, like, we're frozen here, and then they can bring the camera up. Jeff nose. I mean, iPhone's are... already taking 3D photos to a certain degree and layering, you know, with the three cameras and stuff, so. Right, we'll, yeah. we'll get there, yeah. Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, so Hansen, You can look up women's skirts. Like I'm not woman. saying, I'm just saying there's <laughs> going to be problems yeah. eventually. Anyways. Yeah, I uh, think there's problems now. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> That's true. Hey, Ben Van Houten says, hey, hello, guys. Hope you're well during these worrying times. Yeah, we're all doing well. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you had any ideas or plans for literature-focused podcasts on the MinMax Podcast Network. Every time you have JV on, he name drops uh, Thomas Pynchon. I feel a deep sense of satisfaction given how cool and fun Mintrax episode one was, our music podcast. I was hoping for maybe some kind of similar thing for books. Um, that would be fun. Not ruling it out. The cool thing, too, is um, with the deepest dive, instead of calling it a game club, we call it the deepest dive. So if someday we want to do the deepest dive on Michael Creighton, nothing stopping mm. us, baby. Just time and energy yeah, from the community. Just the 20 years it would take us to read every Michael Crichton book. <laughs> yeah, it'd take a little while, but uh, yeah, I would love to do something like that in the future. I am technically a comparative literature major. Ooh. Oh. Uh, this oh. book's heavier than this one. <laughs> <laughs> I like this cover. Uh, hey, Imran, I feel like you uh, buried another lead. You're just, you're a wealth of information. You've been playing Neo 2? Yes. <laughs> oh my God, I know I, this is late, uh, but what, how is it? Uh, I liked it a lot more than Neo 1. I thought Neo 1 was kind of like a very basic Souls kind of game, Souls-like, but I'll, it fell down a lot of places. Like, I didn't like the story. I didn't like the level design. Level design's not that much better than Neo 2, but, like, they fixed the story up a bit to at least be more interesting. They, I, honestly, I think the battle system is probably one of the best battle systems I've ever played in terms of how you get really involved, how you can use your build to break open that game in a way that feels good to you. I don't think it's as good as a Souls game, but I think it does a lot of things better. So it's it depends on if you, if you haven't liked Souls games, and one of the reasons is just they felt a little clunky to you, Neo 2 does a good job of bridging that gap to, say, Ninja Gaiden. I don't think you, Hansen, will like it, because no. it's still, like, mar remarkably difficult. But I think it's, for people who are falling off a little bit off that From Software bandwagon, they might find this one more interesting okay right on oh that's cool um yeah i mean dan tackled this another game for show podcast with him talking about it and he said it's one of the most challenging games he's ever played yes uh it sounds terrifying i did one boss fight like just tries and tries for about two to three hours oh my god that's uh, fun <laughs> kyle or Cyril, are you guys into that at all you're gonna try neo 2 you think this year uh i mean realistically probably not but i'd like to but the, yeah uh the game releases aren't stopping for a while so yeah, I feel like yeah. I've, I've already missed out on my chance to play it, which was like the, the one week where games weren't coming out besides in the tune. Right. Uh, Brady E says, hope you guys are doing well. How's your week specifically going, Jeffum? Good. Right. Brady <laughs> wrote. Uh, Thanks as always for the content. Thank you for your recent discussions on the Final Fantasy VII Remake demo. Your excitement for the upcoming game. Uh, love for the look and sound of what we've seen so far, and especially enthusiasm about the combat. Help me finally decide that I'm 100% definitely not getting this game. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. All this got me thinking about a question that I'd love to hear your responses on. What is the game or gaming series that you respect the most but enjoy the least? Animal hey. Crossing. Yeah, that was actually my answer. Really? Well. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think my, I, my favorite part of it is just like seeing how much people love it and like all the content people post online, you know, videos and stuff. Like that stuff, I... I, I, I like multiple times more than the game itself whenever i try to even think about playing it it just seems like yeah. i don't i don't know that i need this you know i mean i i get it i'm so glad it exists like a game like that but it's just it's just not for me and i've tried every one like i really tried hard the gamecube version the 3ds one and it's just like just not for me but like i i i love the enthusiasm around it like i'm yeah. with you Cyril. like it's exciting to see other people get so excited about a game that is really i mean radically different from other major releases yeah yeah, it's gonna have a big impact culturally on the on the mm. industry. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah well, thank yeah, God. Probably that, the biggest. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but that's why for the deepest dive, we're calling in some Animal Crossing experts. So 
if you're looking forward to that, don't think that it'll be a bunch of people going met on Animal Crossing. It's going to be people <laughs> going to town on that thing. Uh, for me, I was thinking about it. I'm just, I've never really gotten into it, but I respect the hell out of it. And it's a civilization. Uh, I love mm. Fraxis as a mm. studio and I love the idea of that series. I just can't do turn-based mm. strategy yeah. games. Outside That's of weird because it seems, yeah, I, I would think that you'd be a big civilization buff considering how much you like stuff like Age of Empires and Age of... I, like, I guess just 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 the turn based thing, like even yeah. like XCOM, right? And that's turn based. XCOM is, I think, the only turn based game that I really love. Uh, what about Pokemon? But that's tactical, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess turn based RPGs. And I also every love. RPG. Yeah, turn based <laughs> RPGs are different yeah. from turn based strategy. But for whatever reason, you put those two things together, it's just like no. Oh, no yeah. Need. Take no it away. <laughs> uh, let's see. Bob Beal says, "Ahoy, gentlemen, and welcome, Imran." Hi. All right. Bob Beal says, "I bring you a scenario." that I have not been able to conquer in all my years of gaming. You're playing a first-person shooter. Your character's on the roof of a building. You know there's fall damage, so jumping is not an option without facing certain death. So you find a ladder leading down. Let's assume no prompt appears on screen that allows you to press a button, grab the, a button to grab the ladder. What do you do? Because for some ungodly reason, in 30-plus years of video gaming history and advancement, there is no consistent answer to this situation. A ladder going down that is placed at your feet can be a game-ending scenario in first-person shooters, and I've died to them possibly hundreds of times. I died to this exact scenario in Warzone just the other day. Trying to just run at the ladder, and the game assumes you just want to run off your death. Trying to turn around and back into the ladder is sloppy and usually leads to you staring at the ladder as you plummet. Seriously, <laughs> how is going down a ladder in a video game still a problem in the year 2020? Man, I, I still don't know if you press a button or not. Because uh, I feel like sometimes I press a button and it works in Warzone, but sometimes I just climb on my own. It doesn't help that I'm also playing Black Mesa at the same time, which does require a button press. Oh, no. So, so that is, that's a good question. Yeah, it's I like games awkward. that let me catch ladder. Whatever like state I'm in when I'm falling, as long as I can press a button on that ladder to catch it, then I'm good. You have lightning <laughs> reflexes. It's all those stylish action games you play, man. Because for me, <laughs> if I'm falling and even if there's a button prompt, I'm still just screaming and it's all dead. Uh, I think pressing a button, though, is the it should be the sort of standard. Yeah. 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 Like, then you get a nice animation of you interacting with it, and it doesn't look weird, you know, trying yeah. to climb down it, mm -hmm. you know. A button that will automatically spin you around and then put yes. you on it. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and get you at you least down. a couple rungs down, so then you can press down to continue going. 100%. Mm. Uh, an interesting factoid that I learned from visiting Arcane, the Dishonored developers and Prey, is they do not put ladders in any of their games it is literally one of they have like the staples of arcane games on the walls and one of them is no ladders <laughs> because of this yeah. issue but because when it's all about they don't want you to be limited in any way and to limit your power set based in certain situations you know they don't want you to be like well if you're in this room then you can't use your gun to kill this person they want complete freedom for the player and when you're holding onto a ladder your rule set completely changes. And so they don't allow for it, which is very weird. So if you play Dishonored or Prey, no ladders anywhere. It's a weird thing there to think go. about. Um, Aaron Cuton, little cute boy. He says, hey, I was wondering, do you all have a place you like to go to or a thing you like to do to relax slash chill out? It might sound strange, but ever since I was a little kid, I loved going in the deep end of a pool and just sitting down there in the deep silence, thinking about things. I could hold my breath for a long time, like two minutes or so, and it's always been a great escape for me. Being in water in general for me is very relaxing. Is there a place or thing that can really put you at ease? I love that idea of Aaron just sitting at the bottom of a pool to <laughs> chill out. Yeah. Your family must be a nightmare, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, no. It's a boring answer, but the shower is honestly like just a nice mm. hot shower for 20 minutes is the place I go to like mentally recollect yeah hey honest question not talking about a bath when was the last time you sat down in a shower mine doesn't have the space for it right now but i've definitely done it before i would okay. say probably at a year ago year ago yeah. probably three years ago for me you know what's really good though yeah when you draw a bath and lay in the bath and then turn on the shower oh man that's, that's very nice because then you get you get kind of the rain sound too oh Hang on, I think we should all be doing this. Pause the podcast, go boot up that <laughs> it's shower It's a real bath. good use of water, too. <laughs> Record the podcast from Wait, the shower. Yeah, I don't, I don't a wanna, good place to podcast, yeah. I don't want to rush past this, but Hanson said, boot up that shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you might need an SSD. Um, yeah, I mean, with, oh, with gotta... Shower Series X, you can just have multiple yeah. showers going on. <laughs> There's no consumer shower that's that powerful right now. <laughs> yeah. Quick resume from bath to shower, whichever mode you want. Uh, an another serious one, though. Yeah. Um, my my in-laws just got a house up in Pine City, and it's too far out for internet, which is... Love it. At, or, or even cell reception, mostly. You have, I, I think one of her brothers has... Verizon or something that's the only one that he's the only one who can get any kind of messages out but we've we've <laughs> gone up there now several times for for weekends and stuff uh -huh. and her her younger siblings hate it because they can't go that long without internet right but I swear you hit a certain age and it is so appealing to me and every oh, time we man. go up there it like she my my wife still sometimes feels guilty about asking me to do you know family function things with her family too often or how much time we're spending them but whenever she, ever she brings up that i'm like just drop everything absolutely i am happy go. to go up there because <laughs> it is just so idyllic up there there's yeah you know no cars and they have you know like 20 acres of land so you like we're just out there by themselves it, it is the most peaceful thing that you can ever imagine that sounds great yeah i mean growing up uh in the woods it definitely helped and i always think of like as a kid at least there was like one tree that i would always climb and mm. read I remember reading a bunch of Bernstein bear books up there and right. stuff and so it's like I wonder if I could still go up that tree would it collapse I think it could hold me probably I should if I get stressed out from the world uh, I'll just go out yeah. and live in the country and go sit in that tree for a long time beautiful beautiful hey speaking of woods Ryan Wood wrote in and he said have you ever had any insider knowledge about the development of a game that spoiled a moment or broke your immersion when you were finally able to play the final version I remember yes. we, we had to talk the South Park developers out of telling us what happens in the end. Do you remember that, Hanson? Yeah, that's right, for Fractured But Whole. Yeah, they're like, well, we'll run you through the whole story. And we we're just like, N -n -n you don't have to. Like, yeah. you know, we're, not, we're only going to write about this part, so just tell us about that part. You and I'm always in the camp the of, yeah, like, don't tell me things that I can't talk about because I don't want to be yeah. confused in my mind and I don't want it to be spoiled. But, like, I remember on the Order 1886 cover story, we went to Ready at Dawn and... It's like, okay, here's our game, The Order 1886. Welcome. They have like a movie theater type room at Ready at Dawn. And Rue, the creative director, got up and he's like, okay, yeah, this is our game. Uh, we're really excited about creating new IP on the PlayStation 4, The Order 1886. Um, all right, so it starts out and uh, you're Galahad, Sir Galahad, and then these three other people. And he started giving an overview. And then at about minute 40... <laughs> It was became very clear he's not stopping, and he told the entire story of the game mm. up until the end. And PR did not jump in. Full spoilers, full everything. And it was this bizarre moment of like, well, surely he was not saying everything. But then I played the game, and it's like, no, he just told us the entire story. And like, I don't think he'd ever done a Game Informer cover story, so maybe right. he didn't know. And he was probably used to like pitching Sony on the overall story of the game but it was just this bizarre thing of like well i guess no one's gonna stop him all right this is cool story time with rue now hmm. it's very strange uh i think of also on the mass effect 3 cover story trip uh at game informer um i love mass effect and that was such a weird one too because we got there and they're like okay we'll show you some art from enemy designs here's like uh, the Cerberus mechs you'll be fighting. And it was like that wait, moment of like, wait a minute, we're fighting Cerberus? Because we didn't know that, you know, at the end of Mass Effect 2 for sure. It was like, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And then they also had a huge wall that had the entire story of Mass Effect on it. And I remember, it's like, well, I do kind of want to know just the overview because they had like labels and the labels were slight spoilers for the structure of Mass Effect 3. It was Genophage, Citadel, Geth, Cerberus. Those are like the four pillars for the structure mm -hmm. of all of the story. So I remember coming up with a little mnemonic in my brain of like, oh, GC, GC, GameCube, GameCube. So whenever I think <laughs> about like the story of Mass Effect 3, it's like, oh, it's GameCube, GameCube, of course. I've yeah. had a number of times where like we'll play like vertical slices that are just deeper into the game. And then I will mm -hmm. get to that part when I'm actually playing the game. It's like, do I want to do this again? Like yeah. I did the side quest already in a demo. Do I want to waste my time because I know what the result is? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've run it like playing uh, the uh, preview builds for Resident Evil Six is like one of the reasons that it was so hard for me to go back and try to finally beat that game. It's like I don't want to play through that whole portion again that I already played. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, so, yeah. And embargo notes for reviews were always 
very dicey because some sometimes companies would say, okay, here's a list of things explicitly not to talk about. And every now and then you'd get one where it would just be in bolded caps, like so-and-so dying. Don't mention that. And it's like, <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's brutal. Uh, what do you guys like for a question of the week? I am leaning strongly towards Neil Brown's asking about the most satisfying attacker ability to land. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I like that one. I also like the uniqueness of the the like area where you are able to relax. Uh, that's mm. an intro- I didn't have a great answer for it personally, but I was like, oh, I, I liked your guys' answers, and I was like, I haven't really thought about that, you know? Yeah. yeah. In, ter- in terms of discussion, I like the Naughty Dog question, but just because yeah, it let us talk too. about something else in depth. Yeah. Imran, you lean in one way or another as our guest? I'm leaning towards the like visceral attack. Yeah. Okay. I do. I like that one too. Okay. There we go. Neil Brown, thank you so much for supporting us on Patreon. And uh, I am 8-Bit. We'll send you out the vinyl album for Banner Saga 3. That looks fantastic. Oh, was it? Uh... Yeah, Austin Winery did the soundtrack for this. He also did the Journey soundtrack, stuff like that. So congratulations. That's going to be a good one. Um, He's good at making music notes. Hell yeah. And now I think it's time for a little something we like to call Get a Load of This. <laughs> Remote Kyle, take it away. Uh, so there's this tweet. This was March 11th, which I thought was funny and scary. Uh, from Chris Miller of Phil Lord and Chris Miller fame, who are like quickly becoming like my maybe my favorite among my favorite filmmakers, just consistently great, you yeah. know. And uh, Chris Miller tweeted in 2014, Phil Lord and I made a movie about a corrupt businessman president with funny hair who tried to build walls. The Lego Movie. In 2015, we produced a show about the aftermath of a global virus pandemic, Last Man on Earth. This year, we produced a movie about a family surviving a robot apocalypse. Just a warning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fun. So, so that was like, yeah, that's funny. And also... Very tragic. I love <laughs> it. Kind of tragic, but scary. <laughs> yeah. Hey, good times. Uh, also, sorry, by, real quick, by the way, that the, the movie that they're talking about, the robot apocalypse? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That trailer is wild. If you it haven't watched wild. that, I saw it, that. I was like, "This did not go anywhere I expected it to go." Yeah, yeah. Like uh, to the point where I almost wish the second half of the trailer they didn't do any of that. Like mm. that would have been an amazing twist to go see yeah. what happens in that movie. Well, but hang anyway. on. Do you remember the name of this movie, Kyle? Uh, I will in a minute. <laughs> Great. Oh, connected. Connected. There you go. There That's you go. right. Yeah. Go watch that trailer. It's 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 crazy. Yeah. Serial. What do you got? Uh, so I, I just have a quick uh, news story here from gamesindustry.biz uh, that is titled Assassin's Creed Unity was one of the best-selling games in the world last month by what? Christopher Dring. Uh, I'm just going to read the first two guys because it, it's basically the point I was trying to get to. <laughs> Assassin's Creed Unity was the best-selling game across Europe, Middle East, Africa, Australia, and Asian territories last month. The reason for the 2014 the reason the 2014 game performed so well was because its pricing in South Korea and Indonesia. According to press reports, the Ubisoft title was available to download via Steam for less than a cent in those markets. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if it was a price error or if it was just a weird sale, but uh, yeah, apparently apropos of nothing, Assassin's Creed Unity was the best-selling game there you go. everywhere. I that's, love it. That's that's extra weird because they gave it away for free. When the Notre Dame Cathedral yeah. fire happened, yeah, that was maybe true. that there was like still enough people who didn't have that game who jumped on it. I guess they didn't give it away on Steam. Maybe that was the yeah. That, so, part. that is remarkable, but unfortunately, it doesn't count because Surreal didn't say the magic words. That's so. true. It, we'll cut it from the podcast. Jeff, what's yours? <laughs> hey, get a load of this. Yeah, uh, I promise this one isn't political, <laughs> but it it's it's more of a story. Uh, it's a it's a old charming dad story. In term, uh, he, so at 10 o'clock this morning, my dad sent me, my brother, and my sister an email that was just, the subject line was Duncan Hunter. And this, is, this was his email that he felt was very important to send at 10 in the morning. Hi, folks, comma. Today, Duncan Hunter was sentenced to 11 months in jail. Read on Wikipedia about his exemplary life as a congressman, dad. <laughs> and then the set from my iPhone. No punctuation in any of that. Uh-huh. Uh, and so apparently that's what my dad was doing at 10 in the morning. <laughs> Just, oh, that's, that's lovely. Yes, he, he, he sends those kind of messages all the time. He, he has at least figured out technology enough to figure out how to email all of us. All but right. 
but you know there's there's no filter on whatever he's looking up and love it and as an editor it is just a nightmare looking at because because he also put in a tab when, oh, when no. he started the main <laughs> paragraph look you can't turn it off all right yeah. Imran Khan what do you got so get a load of this yeah so there's been a lot of like collaboration I guess between Animal Crossing and Doom fan communities of like just little cute fan art of like Doom Slayer in the Animal Crossing Village Isabel like mowing down demons yeah IGN had an interview with the Animal Crossing developers and asked them about this thing specifically. They are really keen on it. They love the idea. <laughs> Commander keen. So I, I want to read the tweet because IGN asked them, like, why do you think this happened beyond just like the coincidence of date? And their quote is, I think because there's a common denominator of this type of communication happening between Doom and Animal Crossing fans, and also the fact that Animal Crossing is a communication game, we're very thankful and very thrilled to see all this. <laughs> we are so excited at the same time to see how the two fandoms are coming together to celebrate this day. So a little bit of wholesomeness from oh. the Animal Crossing developers about Doom. I love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. uh, mine... Uh, is from a Twitter account, which you might not expect, uh, at TJ Monticello. They say, hey, while you do your part to hashtag flatten the curve with the coronavirus, check out our new guided virtual tours. They'll give you a real-time tour of Monticello with live Q&A discussing topics like Jefferson's role as a nation builder and Monticello as a plantation powered by enslaved labor. But I thought that was cool. You can take a little virtual tour and actually like type in your question and stuff while you're taking a tour. So, hey, nice. crap at home. Take a virtual tour of some American landmarks or wherever you want. Or everybody in the world, come check out Monticello and learn about Thomas <laughs> yeah. Jefferson. This will be neat. You yeah. can do it. Yeah. Uh, community, get a load of this. Yeah. By the way, every every week, uh, Jeffem goes through the get a load of this, which is a constantly updating amazing channel on the MinMax Discord and chooses his favorite. That is true. Uh, but this time I got two and you're just going to have to deal with it. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the first one is from Rook. Yeah. Uh, in the Discord. And he is, he, it's a retweet of a tweet by Mimi Moon at Mimi Moon Cosplay. But uh, it says, five months ago, uh, and this is, this is kind of a quote, what a bullshit death stranding plot you just play as a delivery boy in a world where everyone is locked up in the house and can't go outside. What is this bullshit? And then today, <laughs> and they have a picture of all, it it looks like it's from Europe, but it's it's basically like Uber Eat guys, but they but their backpacks are huge yellow boxy looking backpacks, oh my God. and they're all lined up in the street delivering stuff to people. Perfect. Uh, and then uh, let's see, along the same kind of along the same lines, Smithy, who is another MinMax hero, he posted a tweet by Jesse Morissette, decaf Jedi, uh, is her Twitter handle. She says, remember. Any voice recordings you make over the next few weeks could end up as part of a side quest in the post-apocalyptic near future, <laughs> so plan accordingly. That's yeah, very right. curious. Yeah. Thanks for the community for always keeping that Discord active. Imran Khan, thanks for joining us on this episode, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, also, gosh, we haven't thanked you in person for writing in for the Chrono Trigger Deepest Dive. You're in a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of smart alecky things to say about Chrono Trigger. Uh, how do we do overall? You guys did really well. I think... What was that? Was not the bone I had to pick with you guys. What was the the bone I had to pick with was game of the year last year, when you guys were saying like, what is the best piece of art over the last decade? Van Hansen, how did you not mention the finale of Nathan for you over the last decade? Yes. Well, we just talked about it for just 2019, right? No, it was the last decade because it was we were doing decade stuff. You said Watchmen. Oh no, I think you're mistaken, sir. I think we did greatest piece of art in 2019, but we might have talked about like decade, our favorite games of the decade or something. Maybe we Maybe. talked about it there again, but you're right. The finale. Is from, you from, and I have talked about how good that finale is, so that you didn't mention it was shocking to me. Yes, the finale for Nathan of you, Nathan for you is yeah one of my favorite episodes of TV of all time. It just expands on things in a big way. I have watched it. It's, you know, kind of about a, a love lost situation. I did watch it with a, a woman at, at one point and she's like, this is creepy. Like, this is not. <laughs> it is. <laughs> this is not a fun story. But I think that's kind of the. That, that feels like a big part of it, though, too. Yeah. I, I think mean, so. No denying it. That, that guy's weird and yeah. it's creepy. But it's like that's sort of like Nathan's sort of like exploring that. It's like, well, what what's with you? Yes, we're just digging into weird creeps here. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and it becomes a reflection of the show itself, which is one of the greatest shows of all time. But thank you. Okay, outside of that, do you have any advice for Min Max, uh, Imran? 
you guys are doing great. I'm oh, that's very sweet. Like not, I, I was gonna say, I'm shocked. I'm not shocked. You guys are doing remarkably <laughs> well, considering like where we all came from six months ago, eight months ago, whatever it was at this point. It's August. Yeah. Where we're, where you guys are doing now, and it's as a subscriber, as a patron, it is you guys are doing killer work. That's so it. sweet. Yeah, it's so refreshing to realize like okay we are we are one notch above sustainable for min max overall and then you just have this wave of realizing like oh yeah and there's no middleman there's no yeah. bs there's no there's nothing looming over you it's just mm -hmm. people looming right next to you which is the community you know it's like we're making them happy we're sustainable nothing can get in our way That's not right. even your a parent, virus your parent company is not giving anyone coronavirus well so. you know i don't want to find very <laughs> specifically but yes uh so thank you to everyone that supports us on patreon the 50 dollars supporters here i want to thank them it's i am 8 bit seth walker beaten down brian the smack Juar hello mark seliga jesse vitelli zachary pliggy Mirko Rico torreno rob hudak the rook uh and david lacalucci thank you so much your name is also in the credits of every piece of content that we release here at MinMax. So we appreciate your support. And if you want to get in there next month, you can support us the $50 tier and you'll be included as well. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. We'll get better at uh, recording remote things in the future. We'll iron out some tech details and stuff like that. But hey, I really mean this now. Be good. Have fun. Let's go. And stay indoors. Stay indoors.